Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sales Online Forum 2021. The purpose of this forum is to give presentations on research categories through Zoom and have an online discussion with other participants. The participants will research on the theme related to their given category and present their results in this forum. Other participants will be able to ask questions during the Q&A session. First, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Jashwini, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this forum, The Environment of the Future. Before we welcome our first presenter, here's a short outline on what this topic is about. This research category is described as how much has our world progressed compared to before and the consequences of this progress. For example, green technology, nuclear energy replacing fossil fuels, and affordable and clean technology. The environment of the future offers a good opportunity for us to understand the change in a deeper level of understanding in order to tackle global challenges and issues. In this session, we will find out on how this topic, the environment of the future, is used to solve these matters. Now, we shall welcome Netanya Michael Eaton to give her presentation. Okay, hello. Hello, please. Okay, hello everyone. I am Natanya Michael from SMK Kidurong in Malaysia. Today, I will be presenting my research topic, forest protection. So now, please let me share my screen. Okay. My topic is on forest protection. So for the past two decades, Malaysia has experienced rapid loss of forest cover due to the upcoming urban development and increased conversion of natural land and forestry to palm oil plantations. Ideally, a healthy and functioning forest should consist of a variety of trees and plants providing shelter and nutrients to sustain wildlife. The quality of this life is determined by the variety of animals as well as housing the many important species of small plants. The purpose of my research is to relay upon the importance of preserving trees wildlife ecosystems, and spreading awareness on illegal logging, corruption, as well as the consequences of prolonged damage to our forests. I will be explaining the common causes of deforestation, the effects of forest degradation, and how to overcome these imbalances to our environment. I hope that I'll be able to remind our community on how important it is to care and love our world as it is and preserve it as much as we can. Let us look at the causes of deforestation. It is no surprise to us that a modern and advanced civilization requires an ever-growing amount of natural resources to thrive. Our excessive independence on said natural resources has created an environment that's rife with avaricious intent without any consideration for the well-being of local ecosystems, as well as the entire planet. Out of the many factors behind this matter, is the uncontrolled logging without government permission. It is undisputed that illegal logging activities result in the mass destruction of wildlife and endanger countless species of flora and fauna. All of this just to sustain and expand upon human interests, such as creating farmland, mining oil deposits, clearing space for new development. It is without a doubt that such a lifestyle is unsustainable without any concern for, of maintaining the, the natural environment. So let us look at the picture above. This is an ideal forest for our world to have versus the one below that has been converted into an oil, plum, oil palm plantation 
Malaysia and Indonesia are known to provide the world with most of its su supply of palm oil. In addition, such activities are only able to happen because they are overlooked by the people who are willing to turn a blind eye to further deepen their pockets. The law is absolute, but if those who are entasked with upholding the law are easily swayed by simple promises of wealth and fortune, then how can we expect any change for the better? Leaders are individuals who serve the will of the people. They do not and should not exploit their rank and position for their own personal gain. The government needs to be transparent in dealing with logging companies and must uproot any signs of corruption so that we may seize the, continu the continuation of illegal activities. Apart from that, the world population is steadily growing, and that doesn't come without consequences. More people means more houses need to be built, more food needs to be supplied, and that means more forests are going to be sacrificed. As mentioned before, our human lifestyle is just unsustainable and we need to innovate and discover new alternatives to our current predicament as well as reduce our impact upon the environment. So what happens to the environment and the ecosystem around us? Well, take a look at these photos. How does this make you feel? So remember that feeling. And let us all think about it. At a visual level, we can see that the deforestation has made the land barren and void of all traces of wildlife. What we don't see, however, are the after effects of these events. Wildlife are forced to find new habitats and sources of nutrients. Local plants in Malaysia, such as the Rafflesia and various other species of plants, such as the Kibatalia puberula in the Philippines, are also at risk of going extinct due to large amounts of forest being destroyed. A lot of endangered species of fauna are not only being threatened by deforestation, but by unlicensed poaching too. For example, the orangutans and the Malayan tepper. According to a study, the orangutans were only estimated to be about 100,000 when it was originally 230,000. The, the IUCN states that the number in the Southeast Asian region would be about 2,500, but are now estimated to be only 1,500 left in peninsular Malaysia. There are just a few of them left in the world. Furthermore, the rapid loss of trees constantly destabilizes the integrity of the soil and makes it prone to landslides and sinkholes. It will become a potential hazard if any new developments were to be established on top of weak foundations. This could lead to endangerment of human life and costly expenses needed for reparations. These greenhouse gases cause climate change and global warming for us all. And you wonder why it's so hot outside today. In light of such detrimental practices, we must seek out ways to counteract the effects of degradations of forests. In modern society today, the government of each nation must implement eco-friendly policies that support environmental protection and place tight regulation on logging activities as well as outlaw trophy hunting. Not only must these laws and eco-friendly policies be introduced, but they also must be reinforced upon every individual by police officers and wildlife rangers or even in a restaurant near you.
Aside from that, land acquisition by the state or conservation, conservation organizations must be done in order to secure land for reforestation and rehabilitation of flora and fauna that have been classified as endangered. This declaration must not be lifted with reasons pertaining to expanding further land development. Other than that, we must decide which forest to protect the most. If we were to put priority on certain forests, it would be the mangroves because the ecosystem of the mangroves are very hard to replicate and rehabilitate. This is due to the unique life that thrive within its natural habitat, as well as its natural formation of tree roots that act as a protective barrier. The mangrove forest is important in maintaining water quality, trapping sediments, and filtering pollutants originating from activities in the surrounding areas. Not only that, but the mangrove ecosystem acts as windbreakers, protecting against strong winds at coastlines, which protects the coast from erosion and protects the environment from extreme weather changes. Mangroves, specifically the underwater habitat that their roots provide, offer critical nursing environments for juveniles of thousands of fish species, ranging from one-inch gobies to 10-foot sharks. Microorganisms such as algae, invertebrates, fish, birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians all live and exist in this unique habitat. Additionally, another core solution to helping us protect our forests from further depletion is to plant more and more trees. Several NGOs, as well as indiv influential individuals, have been actively starting as well as supporting other tree planting projects worldwide. For example, Ecosia, which supports over 23 planting projects in 15 different countries. They have now planted over 100 million trees so far. There are other recent projects that also have been established and have been circulating online as of 2019, which is YouTuber Mr. Beast's hashtag Team Trees campaign to replant trees and encouraging others online to contribute to the green earth. Team Trees has planted over 23 million trees worldwide. This is my message to you all. We are responsible for the decimation of our world and need to be held accountable. We have to act quickly and swiftly. We must also take it upon ourselves to practice a sustainable lifestyle, free of excessive waste and pollution. No matter how insignificant our actions may seem, it all plays into the bigger picture of saving our forests and providing a world to be handed down to the next generation. From the moment businessmen and politicians exploited the natural land of Malaysia and Sarawak, it hasn't been the same. However, with the rise of social media, it seems plausible that it has become the responsibility of all parties to spread awareness to the upcoming generations, to care and instill a sense of duty towards the earth. The lush greenery of Sarawak has called upon us to come to her aid. So come, fellow participants, we must take action. Thank you. All right, thank you, Netanya. That was a wonderful presentation. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants here want to ask Netanya any questions? Um, yeah, I do. So my first question for um, Netanya is that, what role do you think students play in conserving forests?
Well, in my opinion, I think it is that, um, you know, on social media platforms where we can all uh, start up our even our own campaigns to like start planting trees or even pick up garbage. So for the young generations of today, we, we really just are very influential and also like to uh, talk about other things and also start doing things online. So, yeah. Okay, All thank right, you. thank you for the answer, Netanya. Does yeah. any of the other participants have a question for me? All right, then, as there's no more questions from the participants, we will be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. There is a question from the YouTube live stream. Why do unlicensed poachers still threaten fauna despite knowing that they are in danger? Well, in my opinion, unlicensed poachers still threaten fauna despite knowing that they're endangered because there's the black market where people are still into buying endangered things because they're so rare. They, they don't get to be seen like in, in person because they're protected, you know, and sometimes they just want it to, they just want to have them for themselves. Like, oh, did you know I have a, a Persian monkey or this Malayan tiger? And they just have a sense of vanity that they want, that they want something so rare that no one else has. So I think that's, that's why. All right. Thank you, Netanya. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Netanya, it's inspiring to see influential people raising awareness on protecting our environment. This YouTuber, Mr. Beast. Okay, but how do we ensure raising awareness on our environment isn't seen as just a trend? Well, one thing is that other than like raising awareness, it's like also to teach children that we have to show them that the benefit of protecting our trees, our forest is very important because like if we show them that, oh, this is just a trend. Oh, I'm just supporting this and that just for, for you know, it's, it's a trend right now. But then if you really think about it, the children these days, they, they need to see proof that we're actually making a difference. So we have to go outside and really look at the world. So how do we ensure raising awareness is, is, isn't just seen as a trend? We need to bring these children outside on the world. Like for example, schools could do uh, field trips on like oil plantations and like uh, lecture us on the benefits or even uh, what's, what's wrong about it. So it really should just be instilled in us when we're young. So that's how we should actually overcome this. All right, thank you, Netanya. Are there any other questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Netanya, what is the best way to spread awareness on this issue? Okay, so if I, if I were to start from the younger generation, of course, it's social media. So, uh, Instagram is what everyone, every teenager would have uh, an account on. So if we were to create a poster, do, I don't know, live streams, they would definitely see this. And for adults, they will also be able to see them on like online platforms such as um, Facebook or maybe even holding programs for uh, forest protection awareness, for example. And thank you. That's it. Thank you for the answer, Netanya. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Netanya. What actions are being taken by our government to curb this issue? Okay, so I have done some studies. And recently, the government has been implementing more strict laws for, let's say, illegal logging. 
So uh, those who do not abide the law are placed with more heavier fines and jail time as well. That's it. All right, thank you, Netanya. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Netanya, since there's no more questions from the YouTube live stream, can I ask a question? Okay. All right, Um. so other than replanting more trees, are there any more ways to reduce the negative impacts of deforestation that already has happened? Well, we could start also from like uh, reducing our waste because other than deforestation, pollution is also taking our trees from soil erosion, from the trash. So we must reduce our trash and like keep it very, very strictly clean because we, we need to prevent contamination as well. So that's it. Thank you for answering my question, Netanya. Are there any more last minute questions for Netanya before we move on? All right, thank you, Netanya. And thank you again for your presentation earlier. Now we shall welcome Zahara Nordin to give her presentation. Hi, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, my name is Zahara, Zahara Nordin from SFK Suratamas in Malaysia. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on the circular economy. Uh, please allow me to share my screen here. Okay, give me a second. All right, you guys can see this all right, right? Okay, great. Um, okay, so the circular economy, um, I'm just gonna give a fair warning that it is a very detailed and very a bit of a complicated topic because it is a systemic uh, solution. But I'm just, my aim today is just, you can start a timer, yeah. My aim today is just to give a brief overview of it. So hopefully by the end of it, everyone will have um, sort of an understanding on it. Um, okay, so before I get into what the circular economy actually is, I'd like to analyze the problem a bit. And Natanya actually raised some really great points in her presentation about um, soil erosion, deforestation. Uh, and I think in the next couple presentations as well, you'll get to see a lot of great people. And I've seen, um, I've seen everyone's presentations, they're quite good, uh, about water pollution, um, sea levels rising, um, waste management, all these things. Uh, but I think what people fail to acknowledge is that all of these problems are actually tied together. You can't solve one of them without solving all of them. It has to be a systemic uh, solution. But in this, I'm going to focus mainly on waste because that is kind of what I think about most when I'm thinking of the circular economy. So an estimated 2.01 billion tons of municipal solid waste was generated in 2016. And by 2050, it's projected that this, um, our waste will outpace the population growth by more than double. Um, so this, will, this not only has serious repercussions for communities, obviously the environment will suffer a lot from this. But one of the main concerns for a lot of people like in the deforestation that was talked about with Netanya is that the earth has um, finite resources. We can only do so much with what we have. And when we are wasting all of the, when we're wasting all of our materials, it makes you think what happens when they all run out? Because obviously, as we all know, it's, um, it's finite. So this, um, the circular economy aims to rethink the entire system of how we manufacture and how we produce um, the things that we need to produce our um, economy. So right now we have a take make, take, make waste system. We, um, do, we take the resources, uh, let's say for example, trees, deforestation, we make our products paper and we throw it away. And that is kind of what we're all used to. It's what we have been raised with. So materials are turned into products, those products are turned into waste. But this is um, obviously extremely not sustainable because um, resources are finite. I've said that multiple times now. Um, so the circular economy, as defined by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a great resource if anyone wants to look into this further, is um, a systemic approach that is designed to benefit businesses, society, and the environment. So there's three main pillars of this. It's designing out waste and pollution, meaning waste and pollution never becomes an issue because it is thought about beforehand and it's systematically designed out. 
Um, keep the products and materials in use. So this would be um, by sharing schemes or recycling or um, returning products, sorry, returning materials to the um, to the base materials so they can be returned to the soil to combat soil erosion and also regenerating natural systems, which is also similar with um, uh, biodegradable uh, products, etc. So here is um, basically from our linear economy to a circular economy, the what just this is a basic chart. Right now it's raw materials go into production, they use and they're turned to recycle waste. What people have started to adapt is the reuse economy, which raw materials go into production and then use, and then they're recycled. But the problem is there's still this non-recyclable waste that we still can't seem to shake and landfills keep filling up. Uh, all these problems keep coming up. So, but the circular economy aims to put these raw materials into production into use and it would go right back into a loop which is a bit um, confusing to think of because it's kind of like, how would we make that a reality? So there's two halves of, um, of a circular economy. It's a biosphere and technosphere. So biosphere can be defined as um, maybe like biodegradable things that can be returned to the natural world without any repercussions. And technosphere would be things like uh, metals, plastics, synthetic materials that cannot be returned. So this is the overview of um, the, circular economy, and I'm going to spend a good chunk of my time here. So on the left side, we have the biosphere. On the right side, we have a technosphere. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief um, explanation because this can go, you can go to hundreds of pages of research about this, but unfortunately, I, I have like five minutes. Um, but yeah, so we start here on the right side with uh, the technosphere. We're going to go from this in loop and outwards. So first is sharing. Um, sharing, maintaining, and basically prolonging the products we already have so we don't have to um, make new ones. And this can be seen um, now through um, car sharing schemes like SoCar or car rental schemes, even Grab and Uber, they are sort of similar to this. Basically, you don't own the uh, item, but you have access to it. It's a shared commodity. Uh, the next is uh, similar to the first one, maintaining and prolonging what you already have. So I think a big issue now is um, plan obsolescence. So your phone breaks in three years and you have to, you can't repair it. You have to get buy a new one. And it's kind of like, okay, that's, that feels like a scam, um, but that's just the way it's manufactured. So in this circular economy, um, businesses would change their models to um, create longer bonds with their customers. So in, um, so the products would last longer and be able to be repaired. And in the next loop here is um, reusing, redistributing. So this would be, can be achieved by, um, sorry, in this one also, it can be achieved by um, like eBay. If you you need something, you don't want it anymore. It can be uh, passed on to a new user, uh, things like that. And so reuse, sorry, I just need to move this. This is my, the zoom is blocking my screen. Okay, so maintaining and prolonging goes back into the service forever. Reusing and redistributing, um, similar things, you know, it's, um, putting it back into the system. And the last one is refurbishing and remanufacturing. So this would be, let's say, um, the phone example I took just now. Uh, in, a, in, a, in this system, basically, once your phone is broken, but ideally after you've used it for many, many years, um, because you've been able to repair it or share it or something, um, something similar, you would be able to give back the parts to the manufacturer and they would be able to make a new phone out of that part, out of those parts, rather than having to source and, and mine new materials for that phone. And the last bit would be recycling, but recycling isn't, there isn't much of an emphasis on it because you would have to, uh, there's a lot of labor and energy necessary to put, to bring the product back to its basic material. So that's basically what's happening on the right side here. Uh, I hope that was clear, uh, but basically it's a system where all the things you use keep getting used um, one way or another, and it keeps going back into the system. On the left side here is the biosphere. So it's things that um, food or paper that can be keep, that can keep um, what's called cascading back into the system. So the cascades here is what you'll notice first usually is um, little loops that keeps going back. So this would be say for example you have a t-shirt and after a while that t-shirt starts to um, after you've used it for a long time because in this in this scenario it would be a good quality t-shirt after you use it for a long time maybe it would be turned into stuffing for a couch or something like that it would be repurposed and back into the go back into um uh go back to the consumer which is you which is us um for the things that won't be able to be uh, won't uh won't be able to be reused it would become uh it would be um through anaerobic digestion it would be broken down back into its basic materials and turned into biogas, which would also continually fuel this 
whole system with the energy, uh, or it would be turned into fertilizer for the soil, which would um, make that uh, um, be good for the soil erosion problem that Netanya mentioned in her in her um, in her presentation. Yeah. So here's some questions that I usually ask. Um, so what are the limits of the near consumption? This is quite um, quite straightforward. It's very material and energy intensive, and a lot of materials end up wasted, and it's not sustainable at all. So some, uh, I think a lot of concern for this as well to what will happen to businesses, why, what is, uh, what is the way forward for businesses, but uh, there's actually a lot of opportunities for circular economy and businesses, but you would have to rethink the business um, model into a long term model rather than a short term one, but say for example, uh, food and beverage industry, you have the waste from that can be used for um, as feed for livestock or return to soil as nutrients. And a lot of another question is, is there business and economic benefits to a circular system? And yeah, so through th that would obviously, this system would create an entirely new, um, entirely new market for circular uh, business. So that would mean, so, because you have, you would have to have more people who would repair and more people who would have the knowledge on these things. So there would be a lot of job creation potential, as well as um, long-term, it would reduce the cost of materials because you wouldn't need, um, you wouldn't need raw materials. You would be, you would keep reusing the ones that were already uh, in the system, and yeah, as well as new business models. So the question now is, what now? What are the steps that have to be taken? Um, the first thing as consumers that we have to do is shifting the mindset. We need to make sure that we um, we actively go and buy things that uh, will last us longer. We reuse. Uh, reusing and reducing our waste overall and shifting to a less buy and throw mindset is important for us as well as businesses have to rethink their business models and start selling more quality products they have a long-term connection with their uh, customers rather than just have one it's right so it would they would offer things like repairs and warranties um, as well as um, new services like uh, that are coming up like rental apps like soca and lastly, and um, arguably the most importantly, is systemic change and policy making. The governments uh, all around the world have to start making the changes and incentivizing businesses to adopt a circular model, as well as uh, being innovative and creating solutions, um, creating solutions for um, for um, the the eco eco no, I can say economic the uh, environmental crisis that we're in right now. Um, so Korea has, also, has taken a few steps and a couple other countries as well. Okay, that is all from me. Is there any questions? All right, thank you, Zahara. You're not kidding and you said it was really detailed. <laughs> I wasn't kidding, man. I wish I was. Now we are gonna have a Q&A session before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. Does any of the participants here have a question for Zahara regarding her presentation? Yes, I do. Um, so uh, my question is, are, here, are there any countries that are already starting to create this? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, before you ask your question, Zahara, could you please stop screen sharing? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Um, give me a second. Uh, okay. I have a question and it's, are there any countries who are already starting to create these policies based on the circular economy? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Bogus, for your question. Uh, yeah. So actually, the uh, EU has started in, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 2015. They um, formulated a policy plan called the EU Circular Economy Action Plan. So they are taking steps to make uh, Europe, it's always the Europeans, right? Um, yeah, the, the EU is starting to take steps towards a circular economy, which I think is great. And I think we should follow suit. Yes, so the answer is yes. All right, thank you, Zahara. Do any of the other participants have a question for her? All right, then, since there's no more questions from the other participants, we will be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. Uh, I'm scared. All right, Zahara, there's a question for you. What is the forest station? I don't, um, I don't know. 
I think would be a good answer. I haven't, this wasn't in my um, presentation, but I'm sure it's a, it sounds great. But fair warning, just in advance for for uh, for everyone. I see some of the participants are laughing. Oh uh, yeah, I it's um I don't have all the answers, but I will try to answer as many as I can. But um, for this, I will I will have to say that I, I do not know. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, since Zahara is not so sure at this question, does any of the other participants know the answer to this question? It's just like PDPR. Yeah, open the floor. Anyone knows? All right, then we'll unfortunately have to skip this question. Are there any other questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Zahara, why is circular economy concept important in terms of the more famous problem? I'm gonna assume the famous problem is that it's um, the environmental famous problem, the, the overall problems. Uh, I think it's important because right now there's a lot of problems and it's, it seems a bit hopeless at times. It's kind of like, why? Um, there's so many problems. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? Everyone's kind of scrambling to get an answer. And it seems a bit um, hopeless. But I think this is important because it is um, a solution. It's a way forward. It's um, addressing um, what can be done rather than what isn't being done and what can be done. It's, uh, it's a solution. It's a way forward rather than... Um, a, a another problem that we have to uh, tackle, but I think it's important because it can deal with many, many aspects of the overall big problem and it creates um, a system. And it, it, it's important in the more famous problem because it can hopefully solve a lot of them. I hope that answers the question, unless it's like some famous problem that I'm not, um, it's kind of vague, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. It's important because it's a systemic solution to many, many problems. All right, thank you, Zahara. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Zahara, what made you passionate about this particular topic? Yeah, who's asking these? Uh, yeah, okay, what made me passionate about this particular topic? I, um, I've always been a solution-oriented person, I think. I think I've always wanted to know, okay, what now? Uh, why after all this, uh, you know, you, everyone always hears about all these problems. It's like, okay, I'm panicking now. Now, what do I do? Um, so I think I'm passionate about this because it's, like I said before, it's a way forward. It's something that can be done and it's not too um, wild. It's not too, uh, it doesn't seem like it can't be done because it, with enough um, government support and enough good policies, it can be accomplished in the next 10, 20 years. And hopefully we can solve the, um, the crisis we're currently going through. So I'm passionate about it because it's, it's, it's a solution. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Zahara. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Zahara, beyond just recycling, how will the way we change product design and industry planning to start to get things right for a sustainable future? This is a good question. Uh, yeah, okay, so beyond just recycling, uh, like I said in my, um, in my uh, presentation, we have to start thinking about how things are designed in the first place, not how things will be disposed of once they are become waste. So we need to start thinking about before anything happens, how do we make sure this problem doesn't exist? So, um, so the way the way we change product design that will make things uh, more sustainable will be we will design out the problem or design out as much as the problem as we can. That way we won't have to, um, obviously we will still have to deal with the repercussions of the waste that we have already created, but we won't have to keep um, figuring out ways of um, combating this issue when it's not, if we don't make it, if we design it out as an issue, if we rule it out as an issue entirely and we, um, and we start changing things now, then hopefully we can uh, in the future the industry will will work in um in in a circular economy. It will work in a circular system that we don't have to even um this doesn't have to be an issue. Hope that answers that. All right, thank you, Zahara. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Zahara. As recycled material would deteriorate after multiple cycles and possibly create non-recyclable waste, what would you do to compensate for this issue? These questions. 
Oh uh, yeah. Okay. I think okay. This is actually um, it's I uh, acknowledge it briefly, but I don't think it was um. I didn't touch on it very much. I didn't have very much time. But as it deteriorates, like I said, there's um biosphere, technosphere, right? Um, the the bio uh, on the bio. Uh, my God, my brain. On the biological side, this would mean um, it would break down into nutrients. So this would uh, this would require a lot, um, a bit of innovation and a bit of technology to move forward. But it's 2021. We have the technology. We have the ability. We have the right people. We have the right resources to um, to combat the issue of um, uh, material degeneration after multiple cycles. There is. There, there are already solutions for this. So it's just a matter of, um, it's just a matter of if we are putting the money, if we're putting, if we're investing our, um, our resources, if we're investing our resources, if we're investing our, our money into this, but it, it has been um, taken into account that it, the, the, um, the material does deteriorate because that is actually a big part of the cycle. The, uh, the biological materials have to deteriorate but if you're talking about the technological side, that is a bit more complicated because as you know, like microplastics, et cetera, et cetera. I think someone is also uh, touching on that in the next couple of forums that it's also an issue. Um, but we have to just think, uh, innovation is the answer. Basically, we have to think in a way that will combat these issues. And I mean, I don't think, um, I don't think the government will be asking me, the 16 year old high school student for the, uh, the answers to this problem. Um, but it's, there are already people who have um, the technology and have the innovation to, to make the system work. So hopefully uh, with the right amount of innovation, with the right amount of technology, this problem um, can be solved. It's, um, it's, it's part of, it's a given that the materials have to decompose and have to deteriorate. All right, thank you again, Zahara. Are there any more questions from the UT live stream? All right, Zahara. Besides Korea, has Malaysia or any other country incentivized businesses to adopt a circular model created policies that will ensure a more sustainable economy? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, Malaysia uh, has some, um, has some uh, environmental policies. Uh, are they good enough? is a question that many, many ask. Are they, um, are they sustainable enough? That's not a question for me to answer, but Malaysia has, has been taking some steps and actually someone is doing a, um, a their presentation later is actually on um, policy, um, environmental policy. So uh, stay tuned for that one. But yeah, like I said earlier, the EU has um, specifically a circular economy action plan. So yes, but hopefully Malaysia can, make uh, some, some, I mean, there have been a few steps, but they, they could be could be improved. All right, yeah. thank you again, Zahara. Are there any more questions from the UT live stream? All right, Zahara, in your opinion, should there be a law implemented for businesses to prolong their product's lifespan as it can be seen as a scam? Man, these questions, you guys are just hitting me with the hard stuff. Uh, should there be a law implemented for business to prolong their product's life scan, uh, life scam, lifespan? Um, uh, I feel like either, either answer will make people angry. Uh, um, it, it can be thought about, I think. I think it's, um, there. I mean, there have been cases like um, Apple was sued a uh, couple yeah last year a couple years back this year i don't know time has lost all meaning to me um but apple was sued because they um because of their um what is it called manufacture obsolescence so it's um it and they the i don't remember who sued them but they won i think so it there has been legal action taken about this so i i think yes that that is that's an option that should be looked into Any more questions from the live stream? You guys wanna just keep drilling? All right, thank you, Zahara. Unfortunately, your time already ran out for the Q&A session. All so right. we will now have Ong Yu Hoi to give her presentation. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Zahara. Okay, everyone. Hi everyone, selamat sejahtera, tak kira Come everyone, let's all enjoy lah, relax.
come look at the screen, enjoy. Come here, please lend me your ears and enjoy. The topic here today, I've written here, my objective is to reconstruct and understand the challenges of renewable energy. But actually, uh, my objective is for everyone to understand, to enjoy, to learn. So there's not going to be anything complicated, but we're just going to learn something new. So, mari kita semua belajar sama-sama. Okay, excuse my other languages, Malaysian. Okay, so let me ask you a question. In class, have all of you learned about renewable energy? Even just a little bit until you're bored? Yes or no? At least in Malaysia, sometimes I would be, but we usually learn about the science behind it, the benefits and the importance. But what about the challenges, the hardships and the lies? My name is Ong Yu Hui from SMK Main Common Ipoh, Malaysia. The topic I have today is challenges of powering Earth with 100% renewable energy. Let's have a look. I always thought that renewable energy was so great because of how we were taught about it. It's so good for the economy and the environment. But it turns out only 26% of renewable energy is used on Earth. Why is that? I kind of feel a bit ashamed and disappointed in myself for not knowing because Whenever we have a problem, we need to know the problem to find the solution. And yet, I didn't know anything about it. I sat there wondering, and then I decided, okay, I need to do a forum about the environment of the future. So how about I learn more about this and tell everyone about the final research? Okay, what is renewable energy? Back to the basics. Any energy source or material that will never be used up and can continuously be renewed. From all my research, so many factors, I have divided them into three, the main ones. Technological and geographical challenges, the first one. The second one is human factors. The third one is accessibility, supply and demand, us, the consumers. So let's look, have a look at the very first one. Technological and geographical challenges. Let me tell you, this challenge is the easiest one to understand from concept point of view. This is because all these geographical challenges, technology can only go one way, improve, unless something goes down and go to crash. But it's only gonna go up, improve, 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 up. Relatively simple. But it's very difficult for us, the common people, to understand everything, the science behind it, because of course the formulas are very difficult. But let me tell you, the very first thing is the power grid. Power grid is basically the way electricity is transported to many different places. But the problem is there is overloading of existing transmission lines. The grids weren't designed to handle such high capacities of electricity. This is because, we'll keep this in mind, most power grids were built about 30, 40 years ago. And at the time, we didn't need as much electricity as we did now. So this problem is very relevant as the government need to put in much, much more time just to ensure that we have a better power grid. Next, we have to look at too much space. Have any of you watched those documentaries with wind farms, solar panels, hydroelectric? Well, those take a lot of space. And a lot of space means a lot of money. And a lot of money means unwillingness to invest. They can take up to 1,000 times more space than fossil fuels. And they cannot be installed near city areas. Take Hong Kong, for example. They are very dense, so we can't just build solar panels on every rooftops. That's just not sustainable. And if we say we build it at another place, the power grids cannot support the electricity there. Next is battery storage. Batteries are very costly and huge. Installing these batteries are difficult too. They require the help of, of many experienced people to build them. All this is equivalent to high prices. And high prices is equivalent to lower accessibility. 
Have all of you realized that all these factors, power grid, space, battery, simultaneously affect one big thing? That's money. Money. So if we look at that factor, we have to look at our next big factor, human factors, because the decision of humans are very influenced by money. So let's look at finances. In the short term, renewable energy is really expensive because of a combination of previous factors. In the long term, they are really worth it, but many go for short term gains. We need to understand why we take these kind of actions for our financial situation, for inventions, for innovations. So that's why we need to look at the valley of death. This is the critical initial phase of a startup company. Many don't make it through. They survive with no revenue and depend on early adopters. This is how it works. We must first understand how money, people, economy works. Only then can we understand how renewable energy is brought to the masses. So in the beginning, somebody has a really good idea. They can go like this. Hey, everyone. Chamberlain, Chamberlain, Sumo, Sumo, Adel Sato, we have a really great idea. Hydroelectricity will one day be much, much better than fossil fuels. So then the height will come here, the highest point of height. Boom! Everything will come here. And then prototypes will be made. Small investments will be made. But what about after that? What if height dies down? Remember, height is not money. Hype is not guaranteed, it's investment. It's just attention, which can get you only so far. So when the hype dies down, there's basically negative amounts of profits. So if your idea, if your prototype is not good enough for you to survive this valley of death, not enough money to fund your research and your company, you're going to wind up here as with many innovations. So if renewable energy is a relatively new innovation, so now that it is new, it will be easily fall into this valley of death where there's just not enough funding to continue. And that's why now we look at the money and now we need to look at the people that drive the economy. That is the law of diffusion of innovation. Lack of people who believe and are willing to invest in startups that won't bring profit for some time. When something brings profit, especially from innovation, it takes a long, long time because it takes a lot of different factors to improve the technology and this and that. So now we have to look at the law for customers, the tipping point. We know money. Hype, die down, not enough money, cannot continue. So now we need to look at the people point of view. Okay, let me tell you something really interesting about our brains. Have you ever had that gut feeling where you do something but you don't know why? You sit there wondering why, then you tell yourself it's because of my gut, as if they come from our stomach. But surprise, surprise, these feelings come from our brain, to be exact, the center of our brain. This is why talking with the wise and the house are really important because if you don't communicate to a person that they want to do this, they won't do it. So let's look at the types of people there are. First, there are the innovators. They will line up days on end just to buy that one product that might not even be that great. They will line up for so long just to get that one product. And then we have to take a look at early adopters. Who are early adopters? Early adopters are people who will only try something after someone else has tried it. If that person does not try it, I will not try it. Same for early majority. If early adopters don't start, then early majority won't start. So if renewable energy cannot get through early adopts, they will never get to the masses. This is a very difficult challenge you not only have to improve the technology of renewable energy, which is already difficult on its own, so many different equations, you still have to look at how money works, how people work, and if you know people don't work very well, they are very uh, 
unstable. One day they want to say they want to eat chocolate ice cream, then the next day they want strawberry. That's not exactly very easy to predict now, is it? So not only the improvements on technology, not only the money and the economics, you still have to understand people. And if people, not enough people, get through this tipping point, not enough will get through to the masses. Development will end. This is why, even if we have the passion for renewable energy, if we don't understand people, we don't understand economics, we don't understand how the products are brought out, nothing will happen. Because in the end, even if your product is great, if the presentation is not great, no one would care enough to go look at it. I'm not saying passion is not good, but if you don't understand, you better start understanding. That is the challenge of getting something to the masses, balancing a lot of different things. Okay, now we looked at how technological and geographical challenges affects how it is brought to the market, how people perceive it, how money is given and how people will support it. So in the end, we will look at the final output, accessibility, supply and demand. First of all, right now, renewable energy are too expensive and they have low efficiency. Too expensive, why? Easy, because of human factors that drive the prices up and technological and geological challenges. Because if, let's say the power grids, if those cost a lot of money, then of course businesses would charge a lot of money for those too. And then if you look at it that way, the prices will never go down. Remember, keep in mind, everything is a cycle. They connect like a ball of yarn. You cannot take them away, just as Zahara said. When you affect something, something will happen. And if you don't do that, another catastrophe will happen. So if we don't look at all the technological and geolog geological challenges, prices will just continue to increase and demand won't increase. Why would I want to buy something so expensive? I understand why. My, my pocket, my wallet, uh, uh, not enough money. Uh, I have no money. Not enough money. So now you have to look at low efficiency. Okay, this is very interesting. We use renewable energy from the sun, right? But the sun is not there 24 7. Luckily, Malaysia only has four seasons hot, very hot, rainy, very rainy. But hot, we still have rainy. If one day, that day, the sun decided, I want to rain today, I don't want to emit my, my solar rays, I want to rain today, then the day will rain and then we won't have enough energy. Rain and then cold blackout, then we will blame the sun, as all, all Malaysians do. So the efficiency is low in a way that if the sun wanted to rain, then we will have blackouts. It's just so inconsistent. In a business model, consistency is important because we don't want investments to suddenly crash down. So that's why we have to look at the dark curve. This is the manifestation of everything coming together. First, let's have a look at this place. This place is relatively safe. The sun is up, everyone needs electricity, then everyone will be using electricity. Enough electricity will be supplied. But what about in the afternoon? In the afternoon, a lot of electricity is supplied. That's awesome, that's great. Here is consistent. Here, people get a lot of electricity. But here is the big problem. You see this group go up like this. At night, the sun goes to bed. Then we can't supply enough electricity for the demand here. The demand is so high. Not enough sun, like solar energy can supply it here. So that's why this is the big problem. Remember battery storage and all those kind of stuff? It's affecting here. That's why it's so hard to invest in renewable energy. This is the final example of everything coming together. In conclusion, everything is connected and complicated as all things are. So why am I focusing on how connected all the factors are? Well, this is because the factors are like a cycle, a big, big cycle jumbled together. And as I said before, everything's so expensive. Why do I need to invest in this? 
we need to break that cycle of music. Oh, it's so expensive, but I know it's worth it. We sometimes go against the logic of short-term gains and go for the long-term gains. So that's why we have to break the cycle. We have to demand for it, take action. And so this is best said by Dalrymple. Challenges with renewable energy is its complexity. It's like playing with 15 dimension chess. What do we do about it now? We need to now take the third step. We know the path, look at the path, but don't look at the obstacles. Take action and follow the path we know and overcome all the challenges I said just now. That is all from me, thank you. All right, thank you, Ong. Uh, please stop screen sharing. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right, Bye. thank you, Ong. I really like your presentation since you're so energetic. All yes, right, now you. it is time. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Does any, before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants here want to ask Ong any questions? Yeah, um, I have a question. Uh, very good points, by the way. Really inspired. So my question is that, um, what is the importance actually of understanding economics and how money flows in the market for increasing the usage of renewable energy? Okay. Renewable energy, first we have to boil it down. Renewable energy is basically another industry, another business. And as all businesses, it goes through economics. Even if you have a great product, even if you have great passion, if other people don't share it, you cannot get make it far. So that's why we must understand economics because renewable energy is basically an industry, a business. So when we understand economics, we can understand the past, present, and predict the future, predict how the market is going to go up or down. What decisions should I take now? Because remember, renewable energy in the end is a business, a industry. Even if we keep talking about long-term gain, short-term gain, we still need to make sure the customers are happy, the investors are happy. So that's why we must understand the science of economics in order to maintain a fine balance of profit and loss so that people will continue. Yeah, that's my answer. All right, thank you, Ong. Does any of the other participants have a question for Ong? All right, then. Now we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Ong. How can companies get their way out of the valley of debt? That is very interesting. Okay, how to get out of the valley of debt? Okay, this is... Let's take an example of... Uh, Microsoft Microsoft have, has made many great inventions in the past, a lot of computers and everything. And when they make inventions, innovations, they make sure the innovations are relevant enough. They don't release an invention before it is ready. They only release it after it is ready. As all of you remember, the value of that goes whoop down like this, right? The companies have to make sure they follow the trend. Basically, to get out of the valley of death, you have to follow a very rhythmic trend. Think of it this way. At first, there's the height, right? And then after that, the height will die, right? Go down. But you don't make it go down to the end. If you get down to the end here, you cannot get out. Seriously, there's no way out. I don't know of any other way. So before it is at the bottom point, you need to make sure it comes back up like this and just very stable before you get to the bottom of the valley. So to get out is basically not to get in at all. To get out is basically to not to get into the valley at all because it's called a valley of death for a reason. So you have to make sure it's just barely hanging on below the line of normal. And then when you have a good product, then profits will come. So the answer is basically to get out of value of death. The best way is not to get in at all. You have to find sustainable ways to make sure the height, the investments are 
stable until you get to a place where your product is really great. All right, thank you, Ong. Unfortunately, we'll have to move on since time already ran out. So now we will be taking a five minutes break before we carry on to the next presenter. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Now it is time for Lok Kang Long to give his presentation. A very good afternoon to everyone here. My name is Lok 
and I'm from SMK LaSalle PJ from Malaysia. Please allow me to share my screen. Okay. So my present in my presentation today, I'll be explaining about my research, global warming, green technology, and daily waste. In this presentation today, I'll be including the introduction to global warming, the causes and effects of it, and what we can do to slow down or maybe even stop it. So what is global warming? Global warming is the increase in the overall temperature of the Earth's atmosphere. In simpler words, it means that our Earth is heating up. This is due to the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is when carbon dioxide and other air pollutants collide in the atmosphere and absorb sunlight and solar radiation that have bounced off the Earth's surface. This phenomenon in which the heat and light of the sun enters the Earth's atmosphere but cannot go out as it is trapped by the greenhouse gases. There are many greenhouse gases, but I've listed down a few, such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. These gases are lighter than air, so it rises up to the other limits of the Earth's atmosphere and settles up there, making an impenetrable barrier that traps heat from escaping. Next up, we have the causes and effects of it. There are many causes and effects of it, but I've mainly narrowed it down to the main few. So here are some of the causes of it, which is waste, deforestation, transportation, and industrial activity. So first off, we have waste. There are mainly two types of waste, which is organic waste and inorganic waste. Organic waste are any material that is biodegradable and comes from either a plant or an animal, such as food and paper. When organic waste decomposes, carbon dioxide and methane gas is created. Methane is created when there is no air present, while carbon dioxide is the nat natural product when anything rots in air. However, inorganic waste does not contain organic compounds. For example, gla glass, aluminium, cans, dust, and metal. It, however, does not contribute directly to greenhouse gas emissions unless it is being incinerated. It does, however, represent greenhouse gases being emitted previously during the manufacturing process. Next, we have deforestation. Plants and trees play an important role in regulating the climate because they absorb carbon dioxide from the air and releases oxygen back into it through the process of photosynthesis. Forests and bushland act as carbon sinks and are a valuable means of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thirdly, we have transportation. Transportation such as car, planes, and ferries emit quite a lot of greenhouse gases. This is due to the burning of fossil fuels like gasoline and diesel that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you might be thinking, okay, um, maybe my destination is like, like 10 minutes away, like my drive is just 10 minutes away. So you might, you might think that uh, yeah, I, it's just 10 minutes. I'm not, I'm not contributing that much to global warming. So imagine what if everyone in this world says the same thing, like 7 billion people says the exact same thing where they say, my destination is 10 minutes away and I do not contribute that much. Okay, let's say that 10 minutes drive releases one gram of carbon dioxide and 7 billion people does the same thing. And 7 billion people times with one gram of carbon dioxide, which, which if we sum it all up, it, it totals up to 7 billion grams of carbon dioxide released in that 10 minutes itself. So imagine what will happen if like it just it just gets prolonged. Last but not least, we have industrial activity. Since the industrial revolution, humans have been burning fossil fuels such as coal and petroleum for energy, which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. A quarter of this is for heat and electricity, while another quarter is for other industrial processes and transportation. The other half of the energy is used for various purposes, including agriculture, cement, pro cement production, and oil and gas production. Okay, okay so what if we just um, ignore everything, like just ignore that global, global warming is happening right now, like we're just in denial, like 
we just act we just act like we don't care about it at all like we just think that it's not important like it won't affect anything at all so there are many future consequences if we actually do really just like be in denial and ignore that and firstly it will be the sea level will start to rise this is due to the arctic melting and likely to become ice free scientists are expecting it to become essentially ice free in summer before the mid century global sea level has risen by about 8 inches since reliable record keeping began in the 1880s experts believe that the sea level will rise by about 1 to 8 feet by the 2100s next we have temperature rise okay maybe this is quite um, quite uh, like you could think of it because even the name itself it's called warming it's heating up so temperature rise is definitely for sure because of this more droughts and heat waves will occur i think it is actually even currently happening right now in the europe areas and and there's the heat waves that are actually quite bad and also there are floods there are heat waves okay imagine if it's already that bad right now imagine what happened if it just the temperature just keeps on increasing like if it keeps on increasing the heat waves will become worse and worse so so by the time by the time by the time it gets worse and worse i think it will be too late to stop it last lastly last but not least we have the loss of biodiversity it also it is so it also includes the destruction of ecosystems this is due to the limited adaptability and adaptability speed of flora and fauna if animals and plants can't even adapt to the climate change imagine what will happen to humans humans will soon can't stand the weather the climate the temperature of our earth we would soon slowly die off one by one and we will slowly be extinct just like the other animals and plants okay let's say maybe we do live longer than the plants and animals there could be economic consequences businesses won't get their resources to create products for the supply and demand of humans because because there is because of this the the scale of the supply and demand will start to unbalance itself and it could really be a huge impact in our economy so what can we do to slow down or maybe even stop it um i there are many solutions to this but i've re researched researched mainly on two solutions which is green technology and the 5r solutions green technology is the usage of science on the environment to preserve the resources and the environment and to control the negative impact from human activities firstly we have hydropower hydropower is currently the largest producer of green energy accounting for over 70% of our renewable energy production the way it works is that special installations are placed underwater where strong currents of water will push through a mechanical instrument known as a penstock this push is then converted into electricity and fed into the energy grid secondly we have solar power solar there are two types of solar power which is solar power for homes and solar power plants however the process of creating these solar panels and stuff it is quite toxic thirdly we have wind power the key to wind power is to place these energy generators in high altitude and high wind velocity locations in my opinion wind power is the more, is more cost efficient than solar and way more easier to construct than hydropower other than that we have geothermal geothermal isn't applicable and everywhere but when it is applicable the amount of energy generated can be very substantial it works by tapping into the earth's intrinsic heat it turns that heat into power and uses that as electricity however we do need to find a high heat underground spot to to do this lastly we have biomass biomass is the conversion of manufacturing byproducts such as wood chips fragments leftover sugar animal manure and anything else that's burnable into electricity this also includes materials produced specifically for the production of energy such as corn ethanol biomass is burned and the heat energy is turned into electricity a great way of disposing of products that might otherwise become waste next off we have the 5r solutions these solutions are quite simple and i think almost everyone here can apply it to their daily lives the 5r 
The five R stands for five things. Refuse what you don't need. Reduce what you do need. Reuse what you can't reduce. Recycle what you can't reuse. And recover what you can't recycle. Refusing what you don't need, it reduces the generation of waste. Every item refused reduces the demand for the production of the item. So the more the demand for the item decreases, the production of that product would also decrease as well. Reducing, basically, reducing means because some of the items we generate, we just can't live without, but we can reduce the use of those items. For example, rather than, rather than buying individually packed items, we can buy items in bulk. This is because items in bulk, the plastic wrapping, the plastic packaging of it is far more less than individually packed items. Next is reusing. Reusing prevents the return of carbon within the materials to the environment for as long as possible, reducing the demand for new raw materials. Next, we have recycle. Recycling is quite a common term nowadays, which I think almost everyone here knows about. However, it is not as effective as reducing or reusing waste, since it requires the waste to be transported to a processing center where its original raw materials are extracted. Lastly, we have recover. Recover what you can't recycle. This refers to the activities which convert waste into another usable form, such as incineration of waste and harvesting the heat to generate electricity. Like I said just now in the green technology side, uh, where this is more based on the biomass, uh, where we compose stuff and we generate the heat into electricity. The electricity produced from the incinerated waste avoids the production of electricity using fossil fuels. The compost produced locks in some of the carbon and can absorb more carbon over time. I hope everyone here learned something new today and maybe we could even apply some of this into our daily lives. I hope everyone here could one day work together and we could maybe set our differences aside and work together to overcome this issue before it gets too late and there is no turning back. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Kang Lung. That was a really interesting presentation. Before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants here want to ask Kang Lung any questions? Yes, I do. Okay, but first of all, thank you for the great, great presentation. And my question is, what should we do to share this issue, especially for the young generations? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think for the young generations, right, um, the best way to show them what is happening, currently happening right now, is like to let them experience it. Like, for example, we bring them to locations that, um, that are actually um, happening right now. Like, um, let's say if we expose them more to the, to the outside world. Well, uh, let's say we expose, it, we expose them more to the global warming world. Like, what is happening in Europe right now, we can maybe um, show them the news. Okay, let's say, like, for, I think the easiest way is, like, to show them the news. Like, what is currently happening right now? Like, the disasters of it. Like, I think if... If they see, if if they if they can think properly, like they can see us being sad for other people, they could they could try to feel our sadness, and maybe sooner or later they could even they they could even realize that all this happening right now is actually bad for everyone. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um. All right, thank you, King Lung. Does any of the other participants have a question for him regarding his presentation? All right then, so now we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Kang Lung, why do you think using wind power is better than solar power? Um, I think wind power is better than solar power is because um, the cost of manufacturing solar panels is far more expensive than wind power. And also the, the manufacturing process of solar panels and stuff for solar power is far more toxic than wind power. Because wind power basically, we, we we need less materials than solar power and also um, the cost and, and it's way more cost efficient and also the production of it is way less toxic than solar power. All right, thank you, Kang Lung. Are there any other questions from the YouTube live stream? 
All right, King Lung, how does tropical deforestation actually cause global warming? Okay, so um, I think, I think um, we have all learned about photosynthesis in our science classes. Uh, it's a process where plants, um, they take in carbon dioxide and they, it releases out oxygen. So carbon dioxide, as I said just now, is one of the greenhouse gases. So the trees, the forest and stuff, the plants, it actually uses that photosynthesis process, process to exchange carbon dioxide into oxygen, um, which the oxygen, it's, uh, it allows us to breathe. Like we need oxygen to survive. All right, thank you for that answer, Kingo. Are there any other questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Kingo, wouldn't it be more efficient to focus our efforts in transportation and industries that make up most of GHG to improve rather than green technology and 5R as we will be solving the problem at the root? Okay, I think that um, transportation industry, like, okay, let's say, let's say we take industry for example, okay? I think if we focus on green technology and we could somehow implement that green technology into industries, um, okay, let's say, let's, say, um, let's say wind power, okay? We can use that wind power to in generate electricity for that, for that industrial purposes. Let's say a factory, okay? We can, we can create, set up like a greenhouse, a greenhouse facility somewhere where it just, the main focus of it is just to um, collect energy, like to just collect green energy itself. And the energy would then be transported into the factory, which is way more green, in my opinion. And also um, for about transportation, right? I think there are a few there are a few things that is actually happening right now based on um, uh, green technology and transportation, such as Tesla, which they are which their vehicles are all um, electricity and not and not and not uh, fossil fuels. Like they are not using fossil fuels at all. They are using they are using electricity, which is far more green greener than than normal uh, diesel cars. All right, Kang Lung, are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, then Kang Lung, since there's no more questions from the YouTube live stream, can I ask a question? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Okay, um, okay. Do you think Malaysia needs to implement more green technology? Um, in my opinion, um, actually, yes. Um, we might say that um, other countries like um, they are not like they are not um, doing that much. Okay, let's say we are not they are not doing that much. But if we look back into our country, right, I think we are actually not even doing that much ourselves. Like I think um, we should be focusing more on green technology as it is a quite a severe con. There will be quite severe consequences if we actually do not focus on it, and it will especially affect our country a lot more. Especially like I said just now, our economy. Like, and stuff like that, like our economy will start to go down. And if our economy goes down, I think our country would go down also. All right, thank you for answering my question, King Will. Are there any more last minute questions? All right, then thank you again, King Long. Now let's welcome Engine Batushin to give her presentation. Um, hi, my name is Engine, and I will be uh, presenting my research um, all right I'm finding sorry uh, just, please. okay um so my research uh, sorry is... engine instead of pressing I'm oh, sorry for interrupting instead of pressing present the view can you just press presentation oh you can show you guys the thing um well, I can't speak without the, okay, all right. Um, so my topic is renewable energy. Um, the reason why I chose this was because um, obviously that renewable energy is very important to our, um, like our environment as well as our, um, uh, our everyday use. So I, I wanted to reflect on how it affected my country and it's like presence in Mongolia. All right, let's move on. Um, so here's our contents. So um, first we're gonna be talking about Mongolian climate and then we're gonna be talking about, uh, we're gonna be developing the topic furthermore. 
Um, so let's talk about Mongolian climate. Um, Mongolia is a, la is a landlocked country between um, China and Russia. And uh, the weather here can be best described as being very extreme. Um, we have some places where the temperatures can drop to a minus 40 um, Celsius and like some places where the temperatures can be as high as a, um, I think it was like 37 Celsius. Um, however, in recent years, we have noticed that it's changing. Uh, for example, in the capital city, um, city Ulaanbaatar, um, we had one of the warmest winters we ever had before. So it was, it was like minus 20 Celsius. Um, so let's talk about how does cl um, climate change affect Mongolian climate? Um, from the studies I researched, uh, it said that the annual mean temperature has increased by um, over two Celsius from 1940 um, till 2000s. Um, that brings up the question, how much CO2 does um, Mongolia emit annually? Um, so in the, uh, in the data, in the table, we can see that in 2019, we uh, emitted almost 65 million tons of CO2. And it, it has been growing a lot and it's predicted to grow even bigger. Um, so uh, what is the main cause of our carbon emission, you might ask? Um, there are a lot of uh, research published that states different percentages, but this is the overall that I gathered. Um, so first one would be land use change. And these would be about, um, so we are a, a country that is very big on mining and we export our minerals out to China a lot. So uh, what the companies do is that they will dig up some sites and they will disrupt the ecosystem, but they won't rehab, um, they won't uh, nurture it back to its original state. And that causes a lot of ecological um, changes such as desertification. And um, they also deforest the land as well. Um, also the machines they use emits a lot of CO2 as well. Um, let's move on to the second biggest contributor. We have our, um, our agriculture. Uh, so ag agriculture is very complicated topic in Mongolia because uh, in ancient times we were nomads and some of us are still nomads. And these people have uh, large herds of um, domestic livestock and they exceed about 63 million um, domestic livestock, um, and that that really um, that really deforests um, that that causes um, desertification as well, and um, yeah, it's it's a really big problem that we haven't really tackled yet, and we can't really tackle because some people still make living on it, and it's part of our tradition and stuff. So. Uh, let's move on to energy. So energy would be um, would be the third biggest contributor. So we have um, seven type. Uh, I think we have seven coal like fueled um, power plants, and then some other like hydropower plants. Um, other than that, we don't have many power plants that are. Um, eco and stuff. So a uh, notable mention is the Gir district. And this district is almost illegal. They're not, these people aren't allowed to do this inside the city, but because of so many people who cannot afford um, apartments, they have settled on these like mountain um, ranges, like inside of the mountains. Um, so what they do is they, they don't have any heatings from the city, so they would burn coals for heating in the winter, and of course it's very unregulated and it's undocumented, 
So what happens in the winter is that these CO2 um, gases, as you can see at the bottom, um, bottom picture that's in the winter and these cloudy, like um, cloudy um, fogginess is caused by the CO2 burned right there. Um, it pollutes our it pollutes our air condition um, air conditions and um, and it also contributes to climate change. So um, types of energy used in Mongolia it would be um, obviously we have the seven types I mean seven uh, seven coal mines no. I um, mean, I'm sorry, but can I just talk with my notes out? I, I think I, I I don't I don't think I can do this. Can I um how do I oh yeah, it's fine. Yeah, because uh why okay, let me just share it again. I think I did something. I don't know why it isn't okay. Because I I chose to to do it. I'm really sorry. Um do you need help with screen sharing? The okay, now I'll present this. Okay, does the um Presenter view come up or no? Yep. It comes up. Yes, you can continue now. It's fine, right? You can't yep. see the presenter view. Okay. Um, so we have seven coal fired power plants, um, two hydropower plants, a small diesel, and three wind power plants, a uh, few renewable energy generators. So um, the current installed capacity in Mongolia uh, for energy um, is over a thousand megawatts of which only 728 megawatts is available due to losses from aging plants and transmission. Um, so it bring, uh, okay. So in the winter, Mongolia buys additional energy to be imported from Russia for heating um, uh, furthermore, with the increasing price of Russian electricity, it has caused a financial vulnerability. So um, our green energy becomes an um, economic issue as well because we are so dependent on other countries for energy that it's, um, that it's technically draining our um, economics and it's making um, life in Ulaanbaatar and other cities very hard because the um, everything's rising with alongside the um, uh, increasing price of Russian electricity. So it brings to the question, what are the best alternative energy for Mongolia? Um, in the research, it's stated that number one would be solar, uh, number two would be wind, and number three would be hydro. Number four would be uh, geothermal. So let's talk about um, solar energy. Um, so in an average year, Mongolia has about 270 to 300 sunny days. Accordingly, solar potential in the country is quite high, estimated to be 11 gigawatts. That is a lot of energy. Um, so there are, so, we are really trying to tap into the potential of that, but there are one solar po power plants in use and three others um, in um, construction. Uh, so on the right hand side, you can see the one that's in use. It's called the Sharp Solar Plant. Um, it can generate up to 24,000 megawatts a year. Uh, it was sponsored by the Japanese um, Environmental Ministry and it was built by um, Japanese companies as well. So the other three in constructions are fairly small, but they're still useful. Um, and they're also all sponsored by foreign entities. Um, so a notable mention, 
would be on the left hand side, you can see what we call a gir. It's our um, traditional like nomad home. Uh, home. Uh, so uh, they would have um, one of one of Mongolia's most successful renewable energy initiatives has been Solar Gears project. What they would do is that they would go around the countryside and they would hand out the solar panels for nomad families to use. And the under the project, we had over uh, 100,000 herder families um, that have been provided with por um, portable solar energy systems since 1999. Um, obviously, there are more um, solar plant power plants, but those are uh, built by private companies, so it's not very well documented. But I have seen some that are private, and they were really huge, but uh, it's unfortunate I can't mention them. Um, number two would be wind, and I will be talking about why it's number two. Um, so with the regard of regard to wind, um, good sites can be found throughout the country. The most attractive sites are located in um, in the South Gobi region, which is which alone is estimated to contain um, 300 gigawatts of high quality wind energy potential. Um, as you can see at the left hand side, the first commercial wind farm project in Mongolia is called Sehit. Um, it, it can generate up to 50 megawatts of energy. Um, it's right outside of the capital, Ulaanbaatar, and it was connected to the um, electricity grid in 2003 and is now generating electricity. So there are more, uh, there are two more. And um, so the reason why uh, wind comes after solar energy is that um, we, we have a lot of um, birds and these birds can get caught up on the windmill. And uh, ultimately if one bird dies, the windmill is hard to repair and the windmill, windmill just costs a lot in our ec economy. So that's when uh, wind is number two. Uh, so uh, let's talk about hydro. So Mongolia has about four, over 4,000 streams and rivers, which are um, primarily located in the Northern and Western areas of the country. Um, and they have the potential for the generation of up to uh, 6.5 gigawatts of hydropower um, currently in use. As you can see at the left hand side, it's called Tashir Hydropower Station. Um, it, it can generate up to 12, I think, megawatts. And there is another in, const in construction as we speak. And that's on the right hand side. So um, last one would be geothermal. Uh, they have identified about 40 possible geothermal sites, um, but we still haven't really gotten, um, we still haven't really tapped into it, uh, but the, there, there is a potential for about 45 megawatts to 900 megawatt, um, megawatts of geothermal power in Mongolia. Um, yeah, but as I said before, we haven't really dug really deeper into it. So it's still it's meh option as of right now. So what's planned for the future? Um, so the government, the Mongolian government approved a national power policy in 2015 that sets Mongolia's mid to long term target and plan for um, 2015 to 2030. In the energy sector, um, the policy aims to increase the power generation share of renewable energy to 20% by 2020 and to 30% by 2030. Um, actually, it, it reached 20% uh, by 2020. So 
um, the policy is right on track. Um, so obviously in 2030, they're trying to make it 30%. Um, as you can see in the picture, it's the national parliament. Uh, so the conclusion is that um, uh, renewable energy in Mongolia is immense and its presence as of now is fairly little, but uh, with the new policies that are pushing renewable energy is probably doing a lot of work on um, improving our quality of life and the quality of our earth. And I, and I hope that um, other kids can research about their own countries and um, obviously raise awareness and start taking actions like doing five hours and stuff. Um, so that'll be it. I'm, I'm really sorry, I got kind of nervous because I couldn't see my um, presenter view thing, but- It's all right. It. All right, thank you, Engine. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants here want to ask Engine any questions? Yes, okay, so first of all, I love your factual presentation. And so my question will be, how, what can ordinary people do to reduce their reliance on coal fuel electricity? Um, so if you, are, um, if you are able to do um, solar energy, like plant it on, on, the, um, on your house or stuff like that, it would be really great if you can take that initiative and really change the way you um, you use your um, you source your um, energy from. So um, solar panels and such could really help a lot. All right, thank you, Engine. Does any of the other participants have a question for her regarding her presentation? All right then, so we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, there's a question for you. Do you think Mongolia is more advanced in the usage of renewable energy compared to other countries? Do you think more advancements could be made? And if yes, what are some examples? Um, so I, I don't think it's more advanced in the usage of renewable energy compared to other countries, uh, for example, Germany and such. Um, I do think we can, there can be more advancements such as um, buildings having solar panels. Um, my school has a solar panel that we use occasionally. And I think it supplies about 40% of our um, uh, it, like daily energy usage. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Engine. Are there any more questions from the UT live stream? All right. Do you think it will be easier to make green technology more popular in Mongolia compared to other countries? Um, so Mongolia is a vast land of almost nothing. So we have a lot of space to um, share with the green technology. It's just a matter of like politics and um, some companies that are coal companies. Um, we have a lot of wind, windy um, season, so yeah. It's very doable. All right, thank you, Engine. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right then, thank you again, Inkjin. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Now we shall welcome Lim Yuzhuan to give her presentation. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so um, my name is Lim Yuzhuan, I'm 17. I'm from SMJK Catholic Malaysia. Please allow me to share my screen.
Give me a second. Sorry. So, okay, I feel like it's a little lighter on my screen. Give me a second. Okay, now. Um, so, okay, so. Good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Sunil Chen. I'm a student in NM from SMG Catholic. Today, I'll be presenting on the title "Food Security for the Forum Environmental of Environment of the Future." So, before I start, just think about it. Like, what if I were to tell you now that we will all, at some point of our time, die like after thirty years? If I were to tell you that you know we have thirty years of living in life. How would you feel about it? Do you do anything about it? So because of this, it's also the reason why I chose this topic. The reason why I chose this is that the inspiration I got was that a lot of people now these days, we do not realize the hardships it takes to actually put food to the table. The sort of complicated process and how the agriculture industry or food industry works as a whole to actually put food on the table. We think that, you know, I think that in this sort of process, it's because of this very capitalistic and hedonistic society that we live in, we human beings only care about the pleasure we get. We do not, you know, see care what's happening. We're most likely going to be very apathetic towards what's happening behind the scene. So because of that, um, today I will talk a little about food security and maybe a little about how, you know, Food and everything is so important to us. So the definition of food security is that um, food security means that people all around the world, um, including the vulnerable, such as whether you're the rich or even the poor, must have access to adequate amount of nutrition, nutritious and safe food resources in order to maintain a healthy life. So as I mentioned just now, by 2050, the global population will rise to 9.8 billion. And the current population now is around 7 billion, if I'm not mistaken. So demand 30 years later would rise by um, 60%. And the problem now is that we do not have a very you know, sufficient or effective food production system to actually put, um, provide us with these adequate resources. And this is why I'm saying that you know, at some point of life, 30 years later, if we are not willing to do anything about it, you and me today, we're gonna die about die to um because of hunger. So moving on, um sorry. Uh -huh. So another reason why I chose this is that I found it very interesting that the United Nations has also set a goal um of you know achieving food security, ending hunger, you know, improving nutrients and um having sustainable agriculture as one of their sustainable development goals for 2030, which kind of, you know, caught in di directly links to the topic that I'm about to bring to you today. And what is the things that actually hinders the progress of our food system now these days? It's things like A, climate change, urbanization, soil degradation, water shortages, and pollution. And this is why in my slide today, I, I would like to share, you know, a few solutions so how we can actually solve this so that you know we wouldn't have to face such crisis um, in the following years so um just um a little heads up it's like i don't really have any like it's just like point forms but i'm trying to make it as simple as possible although it's also quite complicated as well so the first solution to actually solving this is by increasing food production without expanding agriculture land so how do we do this? Number one, by improving crop breeding. In the current technological world, there are certain advances in the molecular field of biology and science itself. And thus we should actually utilize this advancements to further provide cheaper and faster alternative 
in order to map genetic codes, um, DNA traits, and basically genetically modify plants to better adapt to the rising temperature of climate change. And secondly, is by improving the soil and water management, we think one of the biggest problems of not being able to achieve food security is the very fact that we have degraded soils. We do not have enough arable land in place to actually plant food. And what this does is it affects a quarter of the world's crop lands. And a few solutions to actually solve this is number one, agroforestry, which is basically the integration of trees into um, farmings and animals, farmings and animals systems. And other than that, we could also regenerate degraded croplands in order to boost yields um, so that you know, we have enough food production in the long term. And lastly, a solution I would like to propose is that we would have, you know, we should implement um, rainwater harvesting system more. Rainwater harvesting is basically a system we utilize rainwater as you know, a source in order to grow our plants instead of you know the now thing was um considering how we send of usable water in and thirdly is by um planting existing crop lands increasing the multiple by increasing which is basically planting uh, usually, I'm sorry for at the same piece of interesting. land, even though, um, yeah, piece of land. Uh, yeah. usually, when you're breaking up a lot, I think internet is very laggy. Would you prefer yeah. us to play your video? Um, all right, it seems Yujuan had some technical difficulties, but we had a video provided by her, we'll play that instead. temperatures of global warming that's happening in the future. And secondly, it's true so we should I better adapt to the current climate change situations. In simple terms, is that we're going to modify the gen should modify the genetics of current plants so that they can be better able to adapt with the higher temperatures of global warming that's happening in the future. And secondly, it's true Soil, um, the improve of soil and water management. The problem with our status quo right now is that degraded soils oftentimes affect one quarter of the world's crop land. And thus, this is why we propose solutions such as, such as um, agroforestry, which is basically the integration of trees into crop and animal farming systems in order to regenerate you know, degraded lands and to boost crop use. Other than that, I felt like another way to actually solve this problem is through implementing the rainwater housing system that is already proposed but hardly used in status quo. A third way is by planting existing croplands more frequently. So that is this method for multiple croppings that we could actually use. It's basically a practice of growing two or more crops in the same piece of land during one growing season instead of just growing one. And what this does is that it boosts the food production without requiring new land in the process. Fourthly, it's through the adaptation towards climate change. We think um, we need to learn, it's somewhat similar to the first point on improving like genetically modifying crops. It's that we should breed crops to better cope higher temperatures um, in, of you know, the current global warming that's happening. And other than that, we should establish water conservation systems and change you know, our production system as a whole in places where climate change um, affects the most, such as developing countries. Um, the last way is to practicing sustainable farming practices driven by AI. I think a very good um, case study to look at this is the Netherlands, in where they have already developed a sort of technology to control water, light, temperature, and CO2 to kind of imitate environments that could better um, 
uh, that are more suitable towards plants. Other than that, they also have developed technologies that could constantly test on the countless variables that are happening in our world today, such as you know comparing the different LEDs or even increasing um, tolerance of plants against pests such as moth as a whole. And the reason why I think this is a very prominent technology in our world today is because, especially in the Netherlands, they have already created greenhouses that are able to imitate climate across the world. And what this does is that by imitating climate, they can actually transfer this sort of technology and, sorry, transfer this sort of knowledge towards other countries in order to help them to build a more sustainable food system, like the current kind of, um, what they're currently doing towards um, Colombia. Now, moving on to another solution on how we could actually solve the problems of food security. Uh, wait, give me a sec. It's true by protecting and restoring natural ecosystem and limiting agriculture land shifting. Now, it's basically associating efforts of boosting agriculture gains with the protection of natural land. It's basically finding, um, it's finding a sort of balance between both of this and three ways to actually solve this is three suggestions, three solutions to solve this is number one, to link productivity gains with protection of natural ecosystem. So we understand in the current society, especially in developing countries, oftentimes government has this sort of push for more development, especially for roads and more infrastructures. But the problem with this is that oftentimes it's sort of um, excessive buildings of infrastructures often comes to the extent of um, the conservations of agricultures and even comes to the extent of actually hurting a lot of biodiversity and even the habitats of animals. And this is where we propose that you have to find a balance between you know, your economical benefits and a balance between protecting our natural ecosystem. And how do we do that is that we think that governments since governments owns majority of the land and governments have most the most say in more, most of these kind of things, we think that they should control how they want these lands to be. They should have, you know, they should control how who has the right to actually control and develop these lands. And they should limit the sort of development as a whole, over development as a whole. We think a balance must be struck between enforcing land use restrictions and actually, you know, developing the economical of the country as a whole. And secondly, we think that uh, we need to learn, like limit inevitable crop expansion to land with low environmental opportunity costs. How is that? So we can do that by preventing the expansion towards agriculture lands that are not, uh, that are low, um, low in opportunity costs. So just a brief explanation of what opportunity cost is, is that on economical terms, opportunity cost is basically the loss of other alternatives when one alternative is chosen, sorry, when one alternative is chosen over the other. So, um, sorry. So what this does is that we think that, we think um, what this does is that we think we should minimum, we should find lands with minimum carbon and biodiversity, but very good productive potential because we understand that it's impossible to kind of prevent agriculture land expansions because of the rising food demand that's currently happening. And this is why we think it's the best for them to actually um, do this. Sorry, my slides kind of just move a little, just move back. And lastly, we think we can do this by conserving the current and restoring current peatlands. How is that? So we think peatlands uh, account to 2% of you know, general greenhouse gases emissions in the world. Um, basically, peatlands are just places that build up massive carbon in between them, between the soils for hundreds and thousands of years. And the current conversion of this sort of lands towards agricultures and plantations forestry oftentimes requires damages this sort of lands. And what this does is that it releases a huge quantity of carbon at the same time to the end of atmosphere when these lands are destroyed. So we think what we could do is by conserving and restoring this sort of peatlands, like I think the current initiative in Malaysia is trying to do. Now moving on towards my last one on reducing, re reducing greenhouse gases emission from agriculture uh, production. So number one, by reducing 
ambitious to improving manual management. We think that, so just a brief meaning of manual manual is basically animal dung in a nutshell. So we think manual as a whole, animal dung, accounts to 9% of agricultural production emis uh, emissions in 2010. The reason why it, was, it contains a high amount of methane and nit nitrous oxide emissions. So the reason why it's a very problematic thing because the cost of management for this sort of manuals are very high. That's why people are not you know, willing to actually implement this sort of technology to actually manage them. So we think what we could do with this is number one, government should have better regulations of these facilities. And secondly, we think government should fund more programs on developing better cost-effective technologies to actually manage manual as a whole. And secondly, on how you know, we should reduce emissions from fertilizers by increasing nitrogen use efficiency. Nitrogen uh, fertilizers accounts to 90% of agriculture production emissions in 2010. We think that, you know, why is it so harmful? Because this sort of um, greenhouse gas could actually run into grounds or even water sources or even escape towards the atmosphere, causing you know, heat trapping and causing um, the current global warming to worsen. We think what should be done is that we should have, uh, we should have better management for this sort of fertilizer. And we should have so, um, some sort of subsidies for cheaper fertilizers. We think the problem, current problem in the school is that uh, manufacturers do not have the incentive to actually develop cheaper um, fertilizers. So we need to actually implement more agronomic practices and better access to cheaper fertilizers that doesn't really cause, you know, or even limit the use of such fertilizers, such as, you know, only using it when during a certain growing season instead of using it throughout the whole growing season for farmers and etc. So lastly, on how we should adopt emissions by reducing rice uh, management and varieties. So basically rice, certain rice, I don't think people know this, is that it accounts to 10% of agricultural production emissions. And this is the reason it's because it contains a greenhouse gas from methane. So there are three ways we could actually, no, sorry. Yeah, there are three ways we could actually solve this. Number one, we could solve this by increasing rice yields because the methane emissions itself are tied more towards the area than towards the quantity of the production. Secondly, we think we should reduce the duration of flooding in order to reduce the growth of methane produced bacteria. And how do we do this is that farmers can draw down water levels for, you know, for, uh, can draw down water levels during, especially during certain growing seasons. And lastly, we think we should have more, read more uh, lower methane rice is that we think that certain rice are not really uh, you know, accessible to a lot of people. We should have that. And we should, you know, again, taking from the first slide is that we have to genetically modify this rice to be more, you know, uh, less, you know, uh, emit less gas. So for my conclusion of this is that uh, a quote from someone saying that you, know, you can't build a peaceful world on empty stomach and human misery. And we think that, you know, most of, because most of us aren't really aware of the dire situations we are right now, or even the complexity of sufficiently delivering this kind of rice towards a whole population of people. We think the only way to actually solve this problem is when people actually change their views of how they view our current foods, uh, food production system and actually you know, appreciate what's in front of them for the sake of not only yourself, but you know, for a better future as a whole. So that you know, in 2050, you know, your kids or even yourself, we wouldn't need to face this sort of food crisis and we no longer need to stop. Um, now being further to propose, thank you. All right, thank you for the video. Since Yujuan is back, we will still be having a Q&A session. But since time has run out, we'll only be having one question from one participant. So does any of the participants have a question for Yujuan? Uh, yes. OK, we all know how much space agricultural activities need, which is very big. So 
how much space could sustainable agriculture save? Um, okay, so before I answer that question, I apologize for my wife I just now. Um, so like normal woman. Um, so for me, I felt like it's that there isn't any statistics to prove how much land can actually be saved. But from what I know is that at least we're doing something to do about it. At least you're trying about it. So like, you know, it, at least it gives us a chance for, you know, potentially, you know, actually fulfilling our um, food production system in the future. And that at least we're doing something so that in 2050, people wouldn't stop. Um, yeah, so if we just now propose the solutions, you know, if we were actually about, you know, do something about it, um, we could actually solve it. So yeah, I think that's all. All right, thank you again, Yujuan. We will now be having a four minutes break before we move on to the next presenter.
Welcome back, everyone. Now we shall welcome Ruth Mutiara Sharon Siringo Ringo to give a presentation. Okay, thank you. Is my voice audible? Sorry. Yep. Okay, is my screen seen now? Yes, could you please put this in presentation mode? Okay. Okay, so before we start it, let me introduce myself first. My name is Ruth Mutiara Saron Siringoringo and I live in Samarinda, East Kalimantan, Indonesia. Right now, I'm 17 years old and I'm a student in SMA Negeri 10 Samarinda, majoring in mathematics and natural science. And this is my last year in my high school, actually. Sailis is my first international forum, so I'm really excited about this. And I'm a talkative person, and it's really great opportunity to be here and have discussion with people around the world. Also, I want to say thank you to Sri Aman Secondary School who held this event. And shout out to all the committee who did an excellent job. And lastly, I want to say thank you to all the participants. You made my first experience become memorable. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we jump on the presentation. Plastic began to use massively in 1950s. Since then, there are 6.3 billion tons of plastic in the world. However, there are countless amount of plastic that cannot be recycled. Those plastics become microplastics and endanger the environment. The purpose of this presentation is to propose a modern technology to reduce the use of plastic, especially plastic packaging. This research aiming to explain how harmful the microplastic is and introduce a modern technology to reduce the use of plastic that threat the environment. Okay, so move another slide. Yes, microplastic, as the name implies, are are tiny plastic particles. Officially, they are defined as plastic less than five millimeters, zero point two inches, smaller in diameter than the standard pearls used in jewelry. So we're gonna talk about five content about how it started in the past, why microplastics is a danger to environment now. Also, what are microplastic effects in the future? Adible film as future technology to solve microplastic issue. And then the last, the environment in the future with less microplastic damage. How it started in the past. So actually microplastic, actually plastic is begin to production since 50 years ago. Humankind has produced over 8 billion metric tons of plastics. Just 9% has been recycled. Another 12% incinerated. The rest, almost 80% of the plastic ever created, amasses in landfill sites or ends up in the natural environment. Plastic doesn't biodegrade, but breaks down into smaller pieces resulting in microplastics. Most microplastics come from manufactured products that are broken down through degradation, a chemical process that dramatically breaks down polymers. So this is the data about where do microplastics come from. We can see, we can see the big Microplastic is from synthetic textiles, it's about 10, 35%, and then from tires, 28%, CD dust, 24%, and the others. How it started in the past. Researchers at Plymouth University were the first to demonstrate the occurrence of microscopic plastic debris in the environment. Professor Thompson team showed that microplastic particles have accumulated since the 1960s and are first present in ocean worldwide. Since that, small pieces of plastic, commonly referred to as microplastic, were first de described in the early 1970s and are widespread in the ocean. And why microplastic is a danger to environment? First, microplastic can damage aquatic creatures. Why? Because they block digestive tracts, diminish the urge to eat, and alter feeding behavior. Their stomach stuffed with plastic. 
so some species starve and die. Also, fish that ingest chemically treated plastics have resulting liver damage. This liver damage reduces the animal's ability to metabolize drugs, pesticides, and other pollutants. Not only does plastic negatively impact the animal that ingests it, but then some of these damaging substances are transferred to other animals through the food chain. The second is HDPE microplastic lowered soil pH. Why? Because microplastics have on soil microbial activities, which can be linked, among others, to the changes in soil pH. This directly affects the diversity of organisms living there. The third is degradation of growth in the root system. Additionally, a significant positive correlation between microplastic numbers and tertiary roots of ryegrass has been observed and indicated the microplastic retention ability of fine crop grass. And then, wait, and then the last is microplastic exposure can cause toxicity through oxidative stress, inflammatory relations, and increased uptake or translocation. Several studies have demonstrated the potentiality of metabolic disturbances, neurotoxicity, and increased cancer risk in humans. Moreover, microplastics have been found to release their constituent compounds, as well as those that are adsorbed onto their surface. What are microplastic effects in the future? First, microplastic particles linked to harmful health effects. This is this is PCB as microplastics or other chemicals that are linked to harmful health, including various cancers, a weakened immune system, reproductive problems, and more. The second is marine wildlife die of starvation as their stomachs are filled with plastic debris. Marine wildlife such as seabirds, whales, fishes, and turtles mistake plastic waste of prey and most days of starvation as their stomachs are filled with plastic debris. And then the last, created atmospheric microplastic. How this is happened? Because microplastics occur in the atmosphere from urban to remote areas with an abundance or deposition spanning one until three orders of magnitude across different sites. Fibers and fragments are the most frequently reported shapes and the types of plastic which generally aligns with world plastic demand. So edible film as future technology. What is edible films? Edible films are generally defined as continuous matrix that can be prepared for from edible material such as proteins, polysaccharides, and lipids, which can be consumed with the product. Edible films used to control moisture, transfer, gas exchange, or oxidation process. So on the basis of material type, the edible films and coating market is segmented into lipids, polysaccharides, proteins, composite films, and surfactants. On the basis application, the edible films and coating market is segmented into pharmaceutical and food sectors. There are five categories of edible food packaging innovations such as food wrap in food, food pair with an edible or biodegradable container, a cup or container to be eaten with its beverage, packaging that disappears, and edible packaging served at quick service restaurant. If you guys want to see what is edible film look like, it's gonna look like this one. Is it seen? Is it seen everyone? Yeah, it's edible film for candy. Okay, next. Advantage of edible film. Advantage of edible film first, it's environment friendly because edible film made from natural polymers is one of the most environmentally friendly alternative food packaging solutions because it uses renewable and relatively inexpensive materials so that the use of synthetic plastic can be reduced. Edible food packaging technology or eco-friendly packaging plays vital role in green, in green marketing for sustainable environment. The second is reduce the waste and solid disposal problem. 
Edible film is made by natural material such as cassava starch, corn starch, and gelatin. Because of that, edible film is easy to degrade and can be eaten, so it will reduce the waste. But because plastic packaging needs years to be faster. Third, enhance organoleptic properties. Especially for fruits, edible film can retain moisture and improve appearance by providing glues. Edible coatings for, fr for fresh fruit are useful for controlling ripeness by reducing oxygen penetration into the fruit, thus reducing metabolic activity and softening changes. Edible films can serve as carriers for a wide range of food additives, including flavoring agents, antioxidants, vitamins, and colorant. Next, film can work as carrier antimicrobial or antioxidant agents. When antimicrobial agents such as benzoic acid, sorbic acid, propionic acid, lactic acid, nisin, and others have been incorporated into edible films, such films retarded surface growth of bacteria, yeast, and molds on a wide range of products, including meat and cheeses. Various antimicrobial edible films have been developed to minimize growth of spoilage and pathogenic microorganism, including Listeria monocytogens, which may contaminate the surface of cooked ready-to-eat foods after processing. And then the last is shelf life extension and safety enhancement. An increased protective function of food products extends shelf life and reduces the possibility of contamination by foreign matter. Next. Okay. This is about the economical thing about edible film. The growth rate charted by global edible films and coating market from 2019 to 2027 will be impressive and that would lead to a step and upward facing growth curve. The growing focus on packaging material related waste reduction along with growing government initiative to reduce carbon footprint through various food industries is a major factor in the growth of the global food films and coating market. In addition, the increasing use of ready-to-eat food products, along with a changing and a busy lifestyle, is other reasons for target market growth, especially in developed countries. Okay, additionally, it is estimated that around 150 million metric tons of plastics, with more than 60% coming from plastic packaging, thus issues pertaining to sustainability, environmental ethics, food safety, food quality, and product, co and product costs are all becoming increasingly important factors for modern-day consumers. This is the market data for edible film. We can see from 2020 until 2027, it's always increasing because one of the biggest growth factors in the market as identified by transparency market research is its viability as substitute to plastic packaging because environmental, because environmental concerns are really propelling consumers to green choices and materials in their everyday life. It is quite significant to make note of the profile of woke millennial consumers who is concerned of his carbon footprint and impact of his choices on the environment. Additionally, harmful impact of plastics is also garnering eyeballs, leading to demand for better alternatives, driving global edible films and coating market forward. It is notable here that this can be consumed with food without creating a hazard for consumer. Besides, these are effective in keeping the shelf life proper. Okay, so the environment in the future with less microplastic damage. What I hope is environment in the future filled with abundant wildlife and provides us with the clean air clean water and food security we depend on as foundational parts of the planet's natural life support system. My message to other participants is, most people were unaware of microplastics. 
these plastics can quickly find their way up to the food chain and perhaps end up on our dinner plates. We can start an act to reduce the microplastic damage. We can build up an eco-friendly tech to handle this issue. Complete replacement of synthetic packaging is impossible, but its use may be limited through the development of edible films and coating for certain commodity groups. We can promote by carrying out an advertising campaign to promote edible packaging materials in the world market, not only as an alternative to traditional package, special barrier, but also as food products that improve the safety and taste of food eaten at the same time. We are the part of our future environment, and that is our responsible to make it happen. So this is the last of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Ruth. That was a really inspiring presentation. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Before I move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants want to ask Ruth any questions? Oh, uh, yes. Um... Um, Ruth, in your opinion, um, how can we promote edible film to younger generations and maybe even spread it more to government or country? Sorry, I can hear you clearly. Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, sorry. Um, in your opinion, um, how can we promote edible film to the younger generations and even spread it more to the government or maybe the country also? Okay, so... For the young generation, as we know, social media plays its vital role in our generations. So I think we need to do a lot of campaign in social media, such as Instagram, TikTok. By the way, um, just for information, in Indonesia, Adibal Films is raised up because of TikTok. So I think another country can definitely do that. Also in the school, in education, we learn about science, about technology. We can we can use we can use edible film to learn in school so that will spread the issue of edible film. All right, thank you, Ruth. Does any of the other participants have a question for her regarding her presentation? All right then, so we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Ruth, is there any cases of microplastic that shows microplastic doesn't come from degradation, but on purpose made for something? Um, yeah, there, there is a case about microplastic, microplastic made for something not, not for not by degradation, it's it's when, do you know guys about exfoliation? Yeah, there is something like bits there, so that is microplastic. Yeah, it's called micro bits, but yeah, it is made for from microplastics. All right, thank you, Ruth. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Ruth, if microplastics are a major threat to our environment, why do we keep using them? Okay, so actually microplastic, as I said before, microplastic is degradation, but for cosmetic, it, it needs, it needs because it's, it used to exfoliate, but other things, we didn't really need microplastic. It's just because we use too much plastic that break down through a microplastic. So I think, we we don't we don't really need microplastic. I mean, if you want to exfoliate, you can use another option, not just exfoliation with micro bits. So yeah, we don't really need microplastic. All right, thank you, Ruth. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Ruth. It appears that edible film is promising to substitute the use of plastic packaging. So why edible film isn't commonly used now? Why, why edible film isn't uncommonly used now? Because actually for, for developing country, it's, it used a high technology, also quite expensive. And a lot of people doesn't believe that edible packaging is worth as plastic packaging they 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 scared about the content the contamination of bacteria and others so 
So that is why why edible film didn't spread out or didn't use commonly right now. All right, thank you, Ruth. We'll have to move on because time has been finished. So now let's welcome Tuan Aisha Balkis Bindi Tuan Adnan to give her presentation. Thank you. Just let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Balkis from Malaysia and as representative for SMI ITKL, for our discussion today on the environment of the future, I will be talking about ocean warming. My agenda today would be water as an introduction, may focus on sea level and sea temperature, the impacts it comes with, and lastly, my analysis for the problem on the problem. Earth is known as the blue planet, as 71% of Earth is covered with water. Water that we usually see exists on the surface of Earth, but it may also be found beneath the surface and as water vapor around the atmosphere. Water is a finite source. It goes around a circle like the one we learned in school. This is because Earth is a closed system, which means very little substance ever leaves or enters the atmosphere. That includes water. Although from that 71% of water, human is only accessible to 0.5% of it, since the others are ocean water and unavailable, unavailable fresh water, meaning they're either locked up in glaciers, polar ice caps around the atmosphere, as soil moisture, highly polluted, or lies too far under the Earth's surface to be extracted at an affordable cost. Let's say the, Earth's, the world's water supply were only 100 litres. Our usable water supply of fresh water would only be about 0.005 litre, that is one and a half teaspoon, but in actuality, that amounts to an average of 8.4 million litres for each person on Earth. Bear in mind, the same 0.5% of fresh water is continually collected, purified, and distributed in the water cycle. Moving on to the main problem, the rising of sea level and sea temperature. The main reason to our ocean warming today is from the anthropogenic climate change, which basically translates to the stuff we do that affects um, global warming. For example, the greenhouse effects, burning fossil fuels, and deforestation. As we heard from Luke earlier about global warming, I'll just give a brief explanation to it again, because understanding global warming is necessary to comprehend ocean warming, and likewise. Due to humanity's greenhouse gas emissions, sorry, the Earth's atmosphere has become overheated, resulting to punishing heat waves, hurricanes, and other extreme weathers. Our oceans absorbing those heat is a greater problem. The overheated atmosphere has in turn overheated the oceans, assuring a catastrophic amount of future sea level rise. This shows that global warming leads to ocean warming. And if you look closely, every global crisis that human encounter is actually a chain reaction. So basically, just the same as what other participants have said before. Then, from our daily activities, leads to a bigger change towards the world. We can see the global warming through the melting of ice, and that will be what I am focusing on this issue. The sea ice are only crucial to the lives of those creatures that live around the pole. It plays a vital role in determining the climate of the whole planet. The white surface keeps the Earth cool by reflecting most of the sun's energy back into space, while the dark surface does the opposite. It absorbs over 90% of the sun's energy and so warming the Earth. As the ice shrinks, we lose one of the, our planet's protective white shields, not to mention another protection we're losing our ozone layers from the greenhouse gas effects. Then, as the heat season comes, the light filters through the ices, and all these that have been trapped within the ice all winter flourish. This underworld is the polar equivalent of the great grassland. The ice becomes the soil upon which plant life grows and the herds of grazers come to feed on them. The grazers, called Antarctic krills, which is a Caucasian very similar to a shrimp, depends on the ice for food and protection. While the sun shines above, the graze and the algae are protected by the ice, but as the ice melts, the predator, the penguins and the humpback whales, rise. Chento penguins used to be 
rare in the Arctic, but as temperature rise, their numbers have been increasing too. However, for all the humpback whales that comes from the tropic to feed only on krills, their food, supply, their food supply is under threat because of the ice melts. Here we can see the unbalance in the ecosystem and the food chain. In another food chain, polar bears are at the top of it in the Arctic. They mainly feed on ring seals, and so they depend on the sea ice to hunt. They wait for them to pop their heads up from the holes in the ice. And aside from humans, the only threat polar bears are other polar bears. Some scientists hypnotize that food stress is an increasing act of cannibalism, which historically has been natural, but infrequent event. In the far northeast coast of Russia, over 100,000 walruses have hauled out on one single beach, basically a rock island, which they do so out of desperation, not out of choice. Their natural home is out on the sea ice, but the ice have retreated away to the north, and it is the closest place to their feeding ground where they can find rest. On this island, every square inch is occupied. The only way of moving around is climbing over the others, and with their average weight of a ton, those beneath can get crushed to death. The stampede can occur out of nowhere, and so under these circumstances, walruses are a danger to themselves. Some manage to find space from the crowd, like by climbing cliffs nearly 80 feet above, but since their eyesight is poor out of, out of water, going back down to hunt becomes a death sentence. As the ocean heats up, water rises, partly because heated water expands chemically, but also because the warmer waters have triggered tremendous melting of polar ice sheets. As a result, average sea level rise are expected to rise by at least 20 to 30 feet over the world. That's enough to put large parts of many coastal cities, homes to hundreds of millions of people underwater. Kiribati is an island suffering from the sea rise. Its losing land is a crisis they face. Anote Tong, the former president of Kiribati, said, when people talk about rising sea level, they think it's something that happens gradually. It comes with the winds and swells, so it can be magnified. He also said that they are beginning to witness the changing of weather pattern, which he claims is perhaps the more urgent challenge. Clearly, we could see this happening in Malaysia too. The drastic weather change, cyclones and monsoons causing coastal erosion that can be split to two, which is natural hazard and human cause. Being in the Southeast Asia, we get seasonal prevailing wind called the monsoons, blowing from the southwest between May and September, which brings with it rain. Although we usually see the flooding happening in the end of the year, throughout the years, it has become more earlier and earlier. Nonetheless, the cause of the erosion are more likely happening of the human causes, like the interruption of longshore sediment transport by engineering works such as land reclamation and construction of jetties and harbours, removal of natural vegetation such as mangroves resulting in the loss of natural media to dissipate the waste energy, and reduction of sediment supply to the coast, also caused by engineering works in rivers such as dams and sand mining from riverbeds. Tunganu is a coast is the coastal state in Malaysia suffering coastal erosion. The rise of water destroys infrastructure, crops, even highways we use when visiting our hometowns. Floods are the most disastrous natural hazard in Malaysia, which impacts the coastal communities due to the scene of rice. Even though most floods occurred in Malaysia as a result of a cyclical monsoons and inadequate drainage system to cope with excessive rainfall and justifying flooding problem, a series of floods seen in Johor State of Malaysia in 2006 to 2007 are believed to be extraordinary events that are closely related to global climate change and sea level rise impact. In addition, another climate change impact related to sea, which caused coastal flooding in low-lying coastal areas, is known as the Lanina phenomena. According to the Malaysian Meteorological Department, Lanina is caused by cooling of Pacific Ocean and causing higher rainfall compared to normal weather. The impacts of the coastal flood affecting, affecting an estimate of 84 million ringgit of agriculture produce damage or loses affecting 7,000 farmers. As the ocean erodes, not only will it destroy infrastructure and the loss of our homes, but also the marine lives. The water offshore can be muddy, smothering marine life and changing water quality. Then this will lead to loss of beautiful ecosystem near the coast which reduces the tourist interest. 
a study by Sophia Ehsan on current and potential impact of sea level rise in the coastal areas of Malaysia stated that numerous areas in peninsular Malaysia, especially coastal areas, are at risk of being eroded, flooded, and un inundated if the ice coating in Greenland is fully melted. Several studies estimated the likely impact of sea level rise in Malaysia. For instance, Nichols and Mumura has concluded that one meter increase in sea level rise will cause 700 square kilometers of land loss and displaces more than 0.3% of population in Malaysia. And so the government has been given out adaptation measures to reduce the impact of the sea level rise hitting the coastal areas. People around the coast are either given the option to protect their land, accommodate with the sea rise, sea rise or retreat. But how far can we retreat? How long do we have to keep retreating until we reach the end of the shore, the end of the other, the other side of the shore? So to protect coastal development, we'll have, we'll have to employ some sort of engineered structure to defend our lands by creating sea walls or sand dunes. For wetlands, we could create wetlands habitats by landfilling and planting holes to plant to hold the structure, accommodate by employing methods that modify existing resources or developing new standards to decrease hazard risk. So buildings and houses near the coast should be regulated and also increases the awareness of the hazard for flood. For the crops on the coast, people would have to switch to aquaculture or floating agriculture if the water rises. Or we can keep retreating and limit new construction through coastal setbacks, like I said before, until we meet the other end of the show. So this picture, um, it means a lot to me. This is one of my must go to place when visiting Tunganu. It is Pula Kapas. It's not just this island that looks like a paradise, but so many more in Malaysia. If we don't stop the erosion, we lose these beautiful water and, and its marine lives one day. There will be no way to show future generations of how beautiful the beaches we have. Being on the equator gives us an advantage of these gorgeous islands and what it comes with. It's sad how ungrateful we are to be given that and to not take care of it. As a Muslim, we believe that taking care of the environment and the world is our responsibility. It's not stated only once, but repeatedly in the Holy Quran, including the one I've just read, which is Surah Al Fatih, verse 39. That as humans are sent to earth as Khalifa, meaning the successor, ruler, or leader to the world. I personally think that it's very important to plant these issues to, to the young Muslims of how major this crisis is. From the circle I came from, I can say that it's hard for adults to really understand what our world is facing and what it will do to us in 20 years' time. I think the main problem is that people don't realize that these problems change comes due to our lifestyle, our lifestyles and our activities. Because yes, it doesn't feel like it does when you set your mind to that you are the only person doing this. Like how Locke said just now about um about using your transport when you say that your place is just 10 minutes away. Because it really doesn't feel like that. But in actually but in really reality, it's actually a whole nation thinking that way. And it would be marvelous if, if everyone thought like that, if the scenario was opposite, saving the earth, obviously. I'm sure by now, hearing all the proposals from other participants have shared, everyone is waiting for mine. But today, I won't be sharing any. I know that many out there are just like me, who can't contribute by giving ideas for change. And I believe it's okay because we will be the ones making the change. We will make it happen. We will make it work. Being aware and educated in what we are facing is the primary key to making a change. And so I strongly believe that as a responsible Khalifa, individual act is the key to, to the change. The main focus of my presentation today is to get people to understand where the problems are coming from for those who are making changes every day, individually, slowly. Just remember that the wise plummet once said, green green isn't easy. So that is all from me. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, actually. Um, so when you chose this topic, do you have any like sentimental connection to it? Like, why did you choose to um, speak on this topic? 
Oh, yes, obviously I did. So, well, the title of our forum today is The Environment of the Future. But without solving this problem, there is no future, right? So I chose this topic because it was the closest thing to me. Visiting my hometown in Trunganu, I would always enjoy the sea and ocean. We would jump from one island to another, like the ones say it, Pulau Kapas, and also Pulau Redang and some other islands around. So I grew up with the fishes and the corals. Well, the corals are very much older than me, but get what? But the thing is that I saw them change, like I felt the change. So um, there, there's this, it's not an island, but it's like a beach. So Pante Batuburo, where I would fly kites, face erosion. And I just couldn't help seeing these places I grew up with changing faster than I was. And so I wanted to preserve it. And that's why. All right, thank you, Balkis. Does any of the other participants have a question for Balkis regarding her presentation? All right, then, so we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Balkis, what are some daily habits we do that actually harms the sea without us realizing it? Okay, so the reason why I said that um, individual act is the main problem to this is because, yes, because it's us who do this stuff. So, like, maybe us... Um, it all comes back to the root, so from the global warming and from from basically from the root, because like how everyone else said that this isn't something that you can solve one thing. So you have to go back to the root. So maybe um, try using the five R's because recreating more waste is also contributing to ocean warming, global warming, and so yes, yeah, so just basically what everyone else has said, the five R's, um, don't use your transport, like just don't just don't con contribute in those stuff that leads to global warming and other stuff. So yes, those are what I can see. All right, thank you, Balkis. Are there any other questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Balkis, does ocean warming mainly affect countries with ice compared to tropical countries or are the effects the same? Well, you can't compare which one affects this, which one affects worse, because like I said, in the Arctic, it affects the, the marine life there and the polar bears, the penguins. And in my country, in the more tropical countries, it also affects us with the floodings and stuff. So it does, you, can't, you can't choose which one is worse. They're both worse. You can't say that we're going to save um, the, the penguins but we're going to sacrifice the humans. You can't say we, can, we want to um, sacrifice the penguins to save the humans. So they both matter. So yeah. All right. Thank you again, Balkis. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right. Thank you again, Balkis. Now we shall welcome Darshna Wengatara to give her presentation. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Dashna and I'm from SMK Conway Nipo from the country of Malaysia. And please allow me to share my screen. Okay, so I know most of you are probably tired by now, but hopefully you're still with me especially after absorbing all that information from the past presentations, like they were great. I really got a lot of knowledge and after this, also EJAC, I'm sure it's gonna be great. So for our program today, I'll be focusing on policy making, might in human thought and practical solutions against ecological crisis in guaranteeing a better tomorrow. So first as our forum suggests, the environment of the future, I just want to say firsthand that the environment of the future is actually an abstract idea because you can't really see or you don't really know what the environment of the future is going to look like. Unless, of course, you're like Marty McFly or the TVA or something. But I mean, you, you get what I mean. So the best guess that we can actually have about the future is by looking at the past and looking at the present. And this idea is very helpful for when we talk about environmental problems and climate change 
And it's also what environmental scientists do to provide us with solutions. For example, how do and how do scientists even know what uh, carbon dioxide levels were in the past? They weren't even alive back then in 1810 or 1870. So is there like some kind of perfectly preserved air record inside the earth to tell them? Well, actually, yes. And it's not exactly in the earth, but in ice glaciers and ice caps. And okay, so what they do is, this is interesting. So what they do is they drill inside the ice, they drill deep into the ice. And then in these ice glaciers, there are actually ice layers that are deposited every year. So then in these ice layers, there are like some kind of air pocket fossils. And these fossils, air pocket fossils, have a sort of record of how, it, how the atmosphere was like when that ice layer formed. And with this, they can actually give us all kinds of statistics, like carbon dioxide levels are higher today than at any point in the last 800,000 years, because they drilled deep into the ice for the past 800,000 years. So then if environmental scientists have all this knowledge and solutions in their hand, why do environmental problems still continue? And I think that policy making and implementation has something to do with this. So what are policies? Simple. Policies are rules. They are the guidelines for how almost everything in our society works, like how big corporations operate policies, how oil companies function policies, healthcare policies. And why I say that policy making ties into the environment of the future is because when you implement a policy now, you don't really see its impact right away. Like for example, if you said, um, okay, starting from today, Everyone cannot use plastic. Everyone is forbidden from using plastic. So then the plastic in the ocean is not just going to disappear overnight. It takes time. So just like that policies, just like that with policies, you can only see its impact in the future, in the years to come. And with strong policies on environmental issues, you can combat global warming and rising sea water levels more efficiently. As all polluters, I'm sorry, as all companies have to adhere to these policies. So, so this is a good way of dealing with climate change in the long run. And as you can imagine, bad environmental policies or even worse, none at all can cause the earth to, to deteriorate quickly. And there's also another issue which there are sometimes holes in policy making, and this can allow companies to get away with their actions without being held responsible. So first, I'm going to lead you to the basics of policy making, and this one is just the surface. I mean, it's just the surface, and it's it's like a wheel. It's like a bicycle wheel that only stops when you reach your destination. So it all starts with agenda setting, where you identify the problem. And in our case, for example, it's like rising greenhouse gas emissions. So then you go on to form a policy, which is so. How do we solve rising greenhouse gas emissions? You put carbon limits or you put carbon caps. And then you move on to policy adoption or legitimization, where you bring this policy higher up until it reaches parliament and is passed by the government. And this is essentially how most laws are passed, whether it's Malaysia, Mongolia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan, anywhere. And after that, you have policy implementation, where you do whatever the policy states. So for example, carbon limits, what you do, you filter and control emissions from industrial activities. And the lastly is policy assessment, where you decide if a policy is actually addressing the issue or the agenda that it set out to solve. So like do carbon caps work? And if no, then the whole cycle repeats until the policy works. So what kind of policies do we have in place that really affect the environment so much? And I'm just going to go through a very few examples. And the first is the two for one repeal policy. And this actually works because it aims to reduce the regulatory burden of companies from having to deal with so many new policies every day. And what this policy does is for every new regulation, two regulations have to be knocked out. And when they implemented this policy in the USA, 100 environmental policies were rolled back including emission rules for vehicles and power plants. So now I'm going to introduce to you one of Europe's key climate policies, which is the ETS. Not the electric train service, but the emission trading scheme. 
and the ETS works on the cap and trade principle with the purpose of gradually decreasing carbon emissions while moving into the future. So firstly, what is cap and trade? There are two parts of cap and trade, which is cap and trade. So firstly, cap. Cap is the set, is the limit on the total amount of greenhouse emissions that a company can emit. And this limit is reduced over time so that the total emissions also fall over time. And then within this cap, the government can issue a certain number of units or like permits. And these permits sort of allow a company to continue polluting the environment. And I'll just, I'll, I'll get there. So, so what about companies that have no emissions or they use renewable energy? These companies will have extra permits or units which they can use. And these units, they will trade it with other companies. And this is the trade part. So the logic behind cap and trade is, it doesn't matter who pollutes the environment as long as they stay below the limit. So then what's so bad about cap and trade? Well, cap and trade may not work as efficiently due to offset permits that might be issued. And what are offset permits? So when a company supposedly removes or reduces carbon, they get a permit which they can sell. And sometimes it's hard to guarantee whether like real carbon is being removed by this, by this company. And then this poses the risk that permits issued cause false offsets and in the end, carbon emissions, they never decrease, they just stay the same. So I'll give you one example. Let's say a corporation cut down indigenous forests. Then they plant palm trees in this wasteland they created. For this, they can get offset permits. And this creates a false sense, false sense of progress, which is really dangerous. Because in the end, carbon emissions are not decreasing. Okay, so let's forget about loopholes. Sometimes the sometimes the the weakness in the policy is not its structure or how it's made, but in the implementation. And just don't be fooled just because I got two words say in my slide, because weak implementation is a serious problem. Because there is no point of any good policy if there is no implementation or nothing done about it. So then, what sort of practical solutions are there in actually, in actually guaranteeing that the environment of the future will not be so bad? And this part is pretty simple, which is firstly, stop wasting money on policies that are ineffective or policies that don't work at all. And create simple policies which are actually able to be implemented. Don't just create empty pot empty policies with no effect, no implementation, and nothing. And next is build a clean energy economy and replace companies that deal with fossil fuels to use renewable energy sources. And last, and replace consumer products with products that are environmentally friendly. And I mean replace, not add more products to the shelf. Because I remember like this one time, my mom told me to buy tissue paper. And I was just standing there in the supermarket for like five minutes because there were so many options and I didn't know which one to choose. So, so that's, the, that's the problem with the world nowadays. There are too many choices and sometimes the consumer doesn't know what to pick or they don't know what to do. So the awareness is really important. And next, adopt circular economy. And this, I believe, is what uh, Zahara's main point and she explained it really well now. So if you... So if you miss that, you can just rewind. So if we have all the solutions and all the ideas and we know what to do, that the next part that we should worry about is action. And this is and this is where it gets tricky sometimes because human action, sometimes there is no action then. And this is where I move to my next part, which is might of human thought. Sometimes uh, if you turn on the TV nowadays, you are hit with all kinds of environmental issues. Like if you notice lately uh, about Europe, if you saw they got hit by floods, they got hit by um, many environmental problems. And they are the people who are most invested in the environment. They are the ones with really good policies arguably the best policies in the entire 
in the entire planet about climate change. And this can sometimes be very overwhelming because you know, some, it feels like the world is such a big place and no matter what you do, nothing works out. And this is where human thought and human action play an important role. Because when you think, when humans think about something, they are actually very capable of doing what they set out to do. And this is especially in times of crisis and hardship that can inspire people to act in, in exceptional ways. And we are also now in a crisis. Then this whole climate change, environmental issues, we must treat this like a crisis ourselves. So one example of how people act in such exceptional ways is the water crisis that hit Cape Town, Africa. So what happened is the combination of little rainfall, outdated infrastructure and poor planning caused the municipal to announce that water supply had to be cut in most of the Western Cape region of South Africa. And day zero was the day when government would turn off the taps for most homes and businesses to conserve the last supplies. So hospitals and other institutions, they can still get water, but the majority of residents will have to line up at communal water points to collect the daily allotment. So then this day zero, it was actually scheduled for March 18. But then what happened is people started conserving water and they were following restrictions. They were actually working with what they were told to do. And little by little, day zero got pushed back until the day zero countdown was paused indefinitely. And this is all because of the efforts of the people of Cape Town. And the reason I tell this whole story is because it just goes to show that what we can do as humans, because we bring our thoughts and actions with us into the future and our actions are what will determine the environment of the future. And with that, I would just like to end by saying that the future is not yet set. The environment of the future is not yet set. And we actually still have the power to change it and change it and alter it to our own way. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you, Darshna. That was a really inspiring presentation. Before I move on to the questions from the YouTube Live, does any of the participants here want to ask Darshna any questions? I have a question for Darshna. What is the role that we can play in policy making and implementation for the environment, Dashna? Well, we as students, for now, like I'm sure all of us are students, so what we can do is learn about these policies and create the awareness of what these policies do and how they impact our daily life. Because these policies, you can actually search them up on the internet. Like if your own country, I'm sure that every country has its own website and they have the list of policies which, which are in their website and you can search it up and it's all in detail. So the main thing would be learning more, learning as much as you can about it and just creating the awareness so that you know what's happening and be a very informed citizen in the world today. Thank you for the answer. All right, thank you, Darshna. Does any of the other participants have a question for her regarding her presentation? All right, then, so we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Darshna, why do you think some companies still depend on fossil fuels instead of opting for renewable energy sources? Uh, mostly this one is like what uh, Omnivoy said just now, that there are a lot of challenges actually. And one of them is cost. I believe the main reason would be cost because renewable energy sources can sometimes be costly to actually implement and fossil fuels are much cheaper to get compared to renewable energy. So yeah, I think cost is the main reason here, cost and money. All right, thank you, Darshna. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream?
All right, Darshna, if you had to choose the environment versus the economy, what would you choose and why? Damn, I mean, this is a, this is a really good question. I, I feel like this question is what every company that wants to go clean always asks themselves. And it's what every government asks themselves, whether you want to choose the environment versus the economy. And I feel like sometimes it's actually related the environment versus the, I mean, the environment and the economy, because with a cleaner and better environment, then your economy can move smoothly. I mean, if you know, if you get what I mean. So if I had to choose one, I mean, I say, I say environment. In my opinion, it's environment. All right, thank you, Darshna. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Darshna. Don't you think these policies will increase the burdens of upcoming companies when they are in the valley of debt? Um, this is actually why policymakers are there. So these companies, they can actually have um, people who are dedicated in all this policy making and uh, implementation. So I believe it can actually create more jobs in a way, instead of increase the burden. So, because, yeah, I mean, because these policies are actually important. Sometimes this burden, you actually have to carry it in order for the environment. So if you can really, you have to choose, you have to choose whether it's easiness whether you just want to lay back and sit around and then just let the environment, I mean, deteriorate, or you want to do, do the work and put in the effort for a better environment. So it's all in that. All right. Thank you, Darshna. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Darshna. What are examples of policies that are ineffective and don't work? Um, sometimes the policy itself is not really bad. Policies, ineffective policies, I mean, they are, if you search about them, like policies that are not very in detail or policies that are very, that don't really provide a clear framework of what you should do. Those are ineffective and they, are, and they don't work because uh, the people don't really know what they should do. To adhere to these policies and they can be confusing sometimes and the another part like i stated previously is that policy implementation uh that's that's also why a reason policies are ineffective and don't work because you have the brains you have thinkers you have great thinkers in every country they are great thinkers but then nobody does nobody really does anything with the policies that they create so that's that's part of the problem that's a bigger part of the problem the policy implementation all right, thank you again, Darshna. Are there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Darshna, the policies were to affect the production of the company and they chose to leave the country, won't that affect our, com sorry, and they chose to leave the country, won't that affect our economy? Um, okay, this is, this is very uh, economics. This is the economics aspect of it all. So I, I don't feel like I'm equipped to answer this question because in the economic aspect, you really have to see this kind of things actually. There is a risk, but then you have to sort it out so that everything works smoothly. Like it cannot be a perfect world. There can be, there can be um, companies that choose to leave, but then you can like, uh, provide incentives or any kind of benefits that can really help them to actually want to stay in our country and not leave the country. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Darshna. Now we will be having a five minutes break before we move on to the next presentation.
Welcome back, everyone. Now we shall welcome our last presenter for today, Lim Ejet, to give a presentation. Okay, so good day, everyone. I'm Lim Ejet from SQ in Cochrane, Malaysia. So allow me to share my screen. So now today, I'll be presenting on the last topic of the day, which is food waste. Well, sadly to inform all of you, but in the next 10 minutes of my talk, 10,000 tons of food will be wasted. And that brings us on how crucial is the topic on food waste. So today, I'll be covering the introduction to food waste, the facts and figures, the environmental issues, and what technology can do. Okay, so now, what is food waste? So food waste refers to food removed from the supply chain during distribution in shops, restaurants, and our homes. It's either unavoidable or inedible. So for example, we have rotten fruits, coffee grounds, and expired bread. So second question, how is food wasted? So first stage of food waste happens during the production and processing. Most of the losses at this stage have to do with economic conditions and poor facilities. For example, poor farmers may choose to harvest their crops prematurely for quick cash. As a result, the nutritional and economic value of the food drops and its likelihood to be wasted increases. Now, second stage, the retail and food service facility. So now a lot of waste happens at this stage purely because of aesthetic. Do y'all notice how perfectly shaped the fruits and vegetables are? Why? Because often supermarkets make the assumption that consumers wouldn't buy fruits or vegetables that aren't of a certain appearance. Thus, a selection happens before we even get to say anything. And this leads us to where the greatest portion of food waste happens, the consumer and household. Here's where our food level work comes in. 53% of food is wasted at the hand of the consumer. To help you visualize, that's 115 kilograms of food per person every year. So now let's go to the roots of food waste, effects and figures. Food waste fact number one, the tomatoes wasted at home every year have the equivalent greenhouse gas emissions of 51,000 cars. Number two, it takes 330 billion liters of water to grow the bananas wasted at home every year, and 40% of all food never gets eaten by humans. So now, did you know the world dumps a massive of 2.12 billion tons of waste every year? And 47% of it is organic food waste. So let's look at the big picture. Around one third of the food world's food is lost to waste, or you can say 2.9 trillion pounds per year, which is equivalent to 7 million blue whales. So saving even just a fourth of the total global food waste volume can fit all the world's hungry. So now let's look at how it affects the environment. In today's modern world, most of the food we eat has come a long journey into our homes. When we waste the food, we also waste the energy, resources, and the associated carbon emission that went into producing, processing, transporting, and cooking it. On top of this, if food waste ends up in the landfills, it generates even more emissions in the form of methane gas. So now, Let's proceed to the four R's technology for food waste, which is repurpose, reduce, recover, and regive. So the first R, repurpose. Repurpose by using technology that turns waste into energy. So with the innovability of the food waste problem growing, 
some corporations see repurposing food into fuel as a win-win situation. So this new world has a bi biggest biogas facility where they take food waste and transform it into electricity through anaerobic digestion. This technology extracts values from food scraps and turn it into a productive product. So second R, reduce. Reduce by extending the shelf life of the fresh food. So nanopack technology is one startup that's tackling food waste head on with nanotechnology. Its high-tech food packaging films inhibits microbial growth, improve food safety, and thus reduce food waste by allowing kitchen to keep ingredients longer. And another company that's seeking to extend the produce shelf life is Appeal Science. Appeal adds a layer of plant-derived protection to the surface of fresh products to slow water loss and oxidation. And third are recover. Most restaurants will end up throwing the extra food away, and that's exactly what the folks behind the app want to avoid. Too Good To Go is launched in New York and Boston in September and 2020, and over 500,000 people have already signed up, which has saved over 200,000 meals from going into landfills. It has partnered with restaurants, cafes, food stores, grocers, and anywhere food can be wasted. The service is free for customers to use, and this app takes a cut from the salary sales price of the food by one third. And lastly, Regift. Regift by distributing food to people experiencing hunger. Food Rescue Hero consists a network of thousands of drivers who use their own cars to pick up surplus fruits from grocery stores or catered supplies from offices, universities, and sport events and then drop them off to social service organizations. These organizations provide food to local residents who may experience food insecurity. The entire workforce participating in this initiative works on a voluntary basis. And so now, I urge you to be aware of your own impact because the ultimate solution will be us. To eliminate food waste completely, improvements are needed in every step of the food supply chain from production to retail. This takes time and are often out of our hands as a consumer, but a meaningful reduction of food waste is definitely in our hands. So, we are not obligated to encourage technological advancement, but we can all help by doing tiny little things like freezing our meals. Freezing is a good thing to store most foods to keep them from going bad until you are ready to eat them. Check out the Food Keeper app for information on how long different items can be stored in the freezer. Apart from that, every week, you can set aside a night to eat leftovers. Leftovers can be also used in soups and smoothies. Look for websites that offer ideas for reusing leftover ingredients, such as what's in the refrigerator.com. So now, I challenge all of you to take one small change to your lifestyle. Because one action, no matter how small, can make a world difference. Okay, and so these are my resources. And that's all from me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ejek. That was a wonderful presentation. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Before we move on to the questions from the YouTube live stream, does any of the participants here want to ask Ejek any questions? I, um, I have a question. So um, how should we help reducing food waste when the food is already inedible? Oh, okay. So one of the best ways to reduce food waste when it's already inedible, such as like, you know, um, eggshells and banana peels, that will be by composting it. All we need is just like a pot plant and soy and I believe everyone could do it in their houses right now during this pandemic, and it's a really small step to make a big change. All right, thank you, Ejek. Does any of the other participants have a question for Ejek? All right, then, so we'll be moving on to the questions from the YouTube live stream. All right, Ejek. 
How can food waste be generated into electricity through anaerobic digestion? What is done? Okay, so it's basically anaerobic digestion uh, is basically um, breaking down of uh, bacteria in the absence of oxygen. So the um, biogas facility will um, accumulate all the food waste together and then um, I believe they'll store it in a vacuum so that there will be no oxygen and it will be breaking, breaking down by the bacteria. So it's a, basically a biology. All right, thank you, Ejek. Does, is there any more questions from the YouTube live stream? All right, Ejek, since there's no more questions from the YouTube live stream, can I ask a question? Okay, sure. All right, do you think the amount of food waste this year and last year because of COVID has increased compared to before? Oh, I believe um, scientific research shows that it has reduced a lot. This is because like we stopped going out restaurants, buffets are closed, and buffets are one of the main reasons that food waste are wasted like a lot. So yeah, in this pandemic, it definitely has reduced and because we all have home-cooked meals and we have control of our portion. All right, thank you, Ejek. Are there any more last minute questions? All right, there is a question from the YouTube live stream. For people who don't live on landed properties, how can these individuals do to help reduce food waste? Oh, I believe there's those organizations where they do guerrilla composting. So you can bring your food scrap and your, your an edible food products to these organizations, which is available in, I believe, the whole world and they are also in Malaysia. All right, thank you, Ejek. Are there any more questions? All right, thank you, Ejek. Thank you. Our forum for this session has come to an end. First and foremost, Thank you to our panelists for providing their insightful views on the topic, the environment of the future. Thank you also to everyone that has attended this forum. We hope that it has been very beneficial to you in some way or another, and we hope to see you at our closing ceremony, which will be held on the 6th of August at 2 p.m. Thank you.